O God, may your spirit and guidance be in us as we work for the benefit of all our people, for peace and justice in our land, and for the constant recognition of the dignity and aspirations of those whom we serve. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Minister statements. Minister statements. Minister responsible for health and social services. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when I became Minister of Health and Social Services in August of 2020, I had the opportunity to add two personal priorities to the Premier's mandate letter for me. One of the two was to reduce the toll of substance abuse on the residents of the Northwest Territories by leading a whole-of-government interdepartmental approach to developing evidence-based policies and programs and develop a robust addictions treatment aftercare regime, including a territorial alcohol strategy. Mr. Speaker, I chose this priority for a couple of reasons. The first is that I'm acutely aware of the deep damage addictions does to individuals, families, and communities. The second relates to an experience I had in the 18th Legislative Assembly. The Standing Committee on Social Development at that time toured the four treatment facilities in Alberta and British Columbia used by people from the NWT. We met NWT <laughs> residents there and heard the story of their journey to and through treatment. But, and this is a big but, in some cases they were reluctant to return to their home communities because they anticipated they would have nowhere to live and few aftercare supports of the kind they had accessed in the South. I want to provide residents in recovery the services they need to heal. I thought about this priority when I met with staff from the Office of the Auditor General on Monday afternoon to be briefed on their report. I welcome the Office of the Auditor General's report as confirmation of their concerns and as a guide to how we can do better to help residents complete their recovery journey. This audit provides important insights as we continue work to improve addiction and recovery services for residents of the NWT. Mr. Speaker, the findings and seven recommendations align with the health system's understanding of where gaps may exist and where improvements can be made. Providing safe, accessible, and responsive addiction services to help people heal is our priority. This is an area in which the Department of Health and Social Services authorities are already investing significant energy and resources. A few examples of this work include improving access and reducing wait times to community counseling through the implementation of the Stepped Care 2.0 model. Improving aftercare through the establishment of community-based programming, land-based healing, and transitional sober housing options. Engagement with individuals with lived experience and living expertise to increase our understanding of the addictions recovery needs of residents. And finally, improving cultural safety through the establishment of mandatory cultural safety and anti-racism training and the work to establish an Office of Indigenous Client Experience. Mr. Speaker, I'm encouraged the work on the, I am encouraged by the work on these initiatives that it has been validated as useful and significant to addressing addictions recovery needs of NWT residents. To ensure the meaningful use of the information contained in the report, I can share with you that the results will also be used by the Department of Health and Social Services to inform the development of the Territorial Alcohol Strategy, another aspect of my personal priority in this area referenced at the beginning. 
Mr. Speaker, while all of this is promising, I recognize that the audit findings have highlighted shortcomings in the current system of addiction services and supports. There are areas of service delivery and approach that require greater focus and attention, and these are being taken seriously. The Department of Health and Social Services authorities, the Department and the Health and Social Services authorities have agreed with all the recommendations outlined in the Office of the Auditor General's report. The Department and authorities have committed to act on all of them. A more comprehensive draft action plan outlines activities and timelines for improving addictions prevention and recovery services. This document will be shared with the Standing Committee and I look forward to further discussion with them about the audit findings. Together, we will create a more comprehensive response to the Office of the Auditor General. Mr. Speaker, we're all aware of the high rate of addictions in the NWT. This situation is rooted in colonization and the trauma of residential schools. I understand the devastating effect on families and communities across the territory. I'm grateful for the work done by the Office of the Auditor General and for the opportunity for the health and social services system to learn from this process to strengthen addiction recovery services. I want to assure residents this opportunity will not be wasted. The Department and the Health and Social Services authorities will act on these recommendations to make meaningful and lasting improvements to the addictions prevention and recovery system, and to, those, to give those who suffer from addictions the tools they need to regain their health. I am committed to ensuring progress is made. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister Statements. Minister Statements. Minister Responsible for Municipal and Community Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to recognize the athletes, coaches, managers, and mission staff who will be representing Team NDBT at the 2022 Canada Summer Games being held in the Niagara region of Ontario from August 6th to the 21st. The Canada Games provide our national high-performance athletes with venues to compete in hopes of continuing their athletic journey to Team Canada for the Olympics or other international events. Every two years, the, can the Canada Games showcase athletes at the highest level at national competitions, alternating between summer and winter games. The 2022 Canada Summer Games Host Society in the Niagara region will host nearly 5,000 participants, including approximately 135 participants from Team NWT, competing in nine different sports, such as basketball, volleyball, soccer, swimming, tennis, athletics, beach volleyball, and golf. The COVID-19 pandemic altered many aspects of life over the past two and a half years, including sports competitions. In some ways, the Art Winter Games, the North American Indigenous Games, and the Canada Summer Games have been impacted. Recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic will take time and, we will, and will be different for each community and organization. However, events like the Canada Summer Games certainly help our athletes regain the competitiveness that they had pre-pandemic. The Government of Northwest Territory is very proud to support our team at the Canada Summer Games through financial supports and a range of other programs to support athletes, coaches and official development at the local, regional, territorial and national level. In addition to Team NWT, MAC is pleased to support the Youth Ambassadors Program once again, which will see us bring youth volunteers to the Canada Summer Games. The Youth Ambassadors Program offers a guided and structured volunteer experience for youth at major territorial, national and international events. Participants work to develop their life and job skills, as well as build the confidence necessary to deal with some of the life challenges. The program has successfully identified 21 youth from 10 communities who will travel and volunteer at the 2022 Canada Summer Games. We have four participants who have just completed the Youth Ambassadors Program Virtual Edition, as well as 17 youth who successfully <coughs> completed the 2019 NWT Youth Ambassadors Orientation event, but missed out on their volunteer placement due to the cancellation of the Games. 
all youth are between the age of 16 and 22, and they are role models and leaders of tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to wish this year's Youth Ambassadors all the best on this exciting volunteer experience. I'd like to recognize the following group program leaders for their important work in supporting the Youth Ambassadors. Ashley Gillis, uh, Lauren Modest, Conan Donahue, Alicia Coral, and Kyle Donovan. Mr. Speaker, I'd want to recognize the many volunteers who are re responsible for supporting Team NWT, including the Sport North Federation, all the territorial sport organizations responsible, selecting and managing the team. Their contributions are significant and important part of building a healthier Northwest Territories population. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I wish the very best to our Team NWT leaders, the Chef de Mission, Ms. Rita Mercury, and Assistant Chef de Mission, Mr. Damon Crosman, along with the rest of the mission staff, who are, represent, are responsible for managing Team NWT and all the NWT while at the Canada Summer Games. Play fair, have fun, and sincerely hope you all enjoy this truly wonderful experience. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister Statements. Minister Statements. Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, our highways and roads are a critical infrastructure that connect communities, allow for delivery of goods, and provide access to the rest of Canada. Regular maintenance is crucial to ensuring our roads serve the public safety and effectively. That work makes the NWT's highway system resilient to climate change and creates employment and training opportunities for residents. Mr. Speaker, this spring's flood tested the system resilience and impacted our highways. I want to acknowledge the hard work of staff, particularly in the South Slave region, who went above and beyond to keep our highways open and repair any damages to them, ensuring access to essential goods and services during the flood response. I want to thank everyone who played a part in making this happen during a very challenging time. I also want to acknowledge the Department of Infrastructure's Transportation Group. They do an amazing job ensuring our transportation system is safe and working well. Mr. Speaker, as the territory recovers from flooding, the GNWT is also focusing on summer construction season. It will be another busy one. In fact, a total of $81 million in improvements will be made to our highway systems this year. In the South Slave region, the rehabilitation work continues on 12 kilometers of Highway Number 1. This work includes widening of the embankments, re replacing culverts and chip sealing. This is a multi-year project, which is expected to conclude by September 2023. A bridge culvert replacement is also planned at kilometer 20 on Highway Number 1 and will be completed this fall. Various sections of the highway near Enterprise, Kakisa, and Fort Simpson will also receive chip seal overlay from June to September this year. Maintenance and cleaning at the Decho Bridge is also planned for this summer. Repairs to Preble Creek Bridge on Highway Number 5 will also be undertaken this fall. Mr. Speaker, in the North Slave region, the Wati Access Road will be upgraded. This access road connects the community to the newly constructed Klicho Highway. This 12-kilometer access road will receive new gravel as well as have road embankment construction, installing of drainage culverts and replacing culverts with a short span bridge. This project is expected to be completed by fall of 2023. Also this year, a 23-kilometer section of Highway Number 3 will receive surface repairs and resurfacing along with chip seal. On high, Highway Number 4, the Ingham Trail, rehabilitation continues on roughly 5 kilometers of that road. Work will include repairing dips, widening the embankment, replacing culverts, and chip sealing. This project is expected to be completed by September 2023. In the Decho region, rehabilitation work continues on Highway Number 7, the Liard Highway. Crews are focused on widening the embankment, replacing culverts, and strengthening the road. This work is expected to be completed in September 2023. 
in the Beaufort Delta, rehabilitation work on the Inuvik Tuck Highway continues. This work is anticipated to be completed by September 2027. Highway number 8 at kilometer 239 will see a bridge culvert repairs and highway number 10 at kilometer 8.3 will see re rehabilitation of the bridge embankment. Mr. Speaker, as our summer highway construction season gets underway, our construction crews will be hard at work on the NWT roads. I want to remind residents this summer to watch for highway crews, slow down in construction zones, obey signs while they are driving. Let us make sure the summer construction season is a safe one for infrastructure employees and contractors, and those also traveling on our highways. Queen Aini, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister statements. Minister statements. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to NWT small communities, each is impacted by the high cost of living, limited business opportunities, lack of sustainable employment, lack of acceptable, uh, acceptable housing, lack of an acceptable level of health care, <coughs> education and infrastructure. All issues that have been discussed on the floor of this House over the years by various MLAs with minimal resolve. Mr. Speaker, in a previous statement I pointed out that, above all, one major project that would have a substantial impact on the economy and on the lives of residents in the M NWT is the completion of the Mackenzie Valley Highway from Wrigley to the Dempster. Mr. Speaker, the Mackenzie Valley Highway is designated as part of Canada's national highway system, a national dream in the making since as early as the 1940s. Realizing this dream has been difficult for many reasons, and it is a dream that cannot be realized without the financial and po political support of the federal government and the persuasive political will by this government. Mr. Speaker, the residents of the NWT are still looking for that elusive highway and the possibilities it would provide and the dreams it would make come true for many. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to a major life-changing projects, government, governments excel at developing more strategy, more social and economic studies, more evaluations, more planning, <coughs> disjointed consultations, red tape and restrictive legislation all of which work against timely development. While residents are forced to scratch out a living, where not only do you now need two persons in a house, household working, but your children as well, if you expect to make ends meet. Mr. Speaker, over the past several decades, minimal progress has been made on advancing this project. And the lack of speed at which progress has been made is only resulting in the cost of construction to continue to rise exponentially. This elusive highway, once pegged to cost around $700 million for the Wrigley to Norman Wells portion, we can now expect that number to grow to well over $1 billion. Now you add in the Norman Wells to the Dempster portion, we can add another $1.5 billion plus dollars to the cost. Then we're looking at around $2.5 billion to complete. With the cost of labor, fuel and materials rising, we can only expect that construction costs will continue to rise to the point where the political will may wane, and the completion of the highway will need to, a push from Indigenous governments and industry to make it a reality. Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to conclude my statement. Thank you, Member for Haver South. The Member seeking unanimous consent to conclude a statement. Are there any nays? There are no nays. You may conclude your statement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we talk of lowering the cost of living, <coughs> providing a gateway to resources, fortifying northern sovereignty, then it is imperative that this government aggressively encourage the federal government to step up to the plate financially on this dream. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Inuvik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to say how glad I am to, um, to see the senior Indigenous patient advocate finally advertised. This was a position that the regular members raised during the budget process, the previous budget process, as a need for this territory. Mr. Speaker, I also want to point out that this position has been evaluated at a pay range that is not an entry-level position, which is, is excellent, and that the screening criteria is, added, is not adding unnecessary barriers like degrees and masters, but recognizing experience and lived experience 
and I'm sure we'll get some excellent candidates in this role, in these roles. Mr. Speaker, this brings me to think about how all our job descriptions in the GNWT are in desperate need to be reevaluated and updated to remove unnecessary barriers that are put into them. I also believe that there are needs there are there needs to be more emphasis put into cultural and lived experience, especially in areas like health, education, justice, child and family services. They need the they need sorry services counted as experience and equivalencies. With the recent class graduating from the Northern Indigenous Counseling Program, I congratulate them. I personally know some of them, and I know that they're going to do amazing work. But I look at the screening criteria, for example, the Child and Youth Care Counselor position. They are calling for a master's in one year experience, or a degree in three years experience, when I know they would be amazing with our youth in these roles. Mr. Speaker, the GNWT needs to be transparent in how they measure equivalencies and desperately need to add lived and cultural experience to how they measure experience. Mr. Speaker, this needs to be done and made public so the NWT residents and anyone who is applying for jobs can see it and can use it to see what their education and experience will be measured at when applying for jobs. Because as it stands right now, there is no one way of doing this, and sometimes it's not being done at all. And therefore, people are being screened out of jobs, job competitions, and some who may be excellent candidates are not even applying. I will have questions for the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nivik Twin Lakes. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Thabatcha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the other day on May 30th, the Mayor and Council of Yellowknife held a meeting to discuss whether the city should enter into a memorandum of understanding with Aurora College and the Government of the Northwest Territories about the location of the Yellowknife campus for the future Polytechnic University. There were multiple media reports about that meeting, which implied some concerning and misleading information about the future Polytechnic University and where its main campus and headquarters will be located. Mr. Speaker, it has already been reiterated several times by the Minister of Education that the headquarters and the main campus of the future Polytechnic University will be located in Fort Smith. On three different occasions, Ms. Minister Simpson said the headquarters will remain in Fort Smith and will not move after the transformation is complete. First, on December the 10th, 2019, during my statement and questions, I asked about this issue, and the minister assured me there would, were no plans to move the headquarters out of Fort Smith. Then on October 22nd, 2020, I again spoke and asked questions on this, and the minister said he was not aware of any discussion within the department to move the headquarters anywhere else. Then on May 29th, 2022, at a committee of the whole, Ms. Minister Simpson said the department was not going to build a new headquarters because there was an already a location for it, which is Fort Smith. Mr. Speaker, misinformation in the media and other political agenda agendas must not cloud the opportunity for three strong campuses to exist with the future Polytechnic University. Neutral decisions by officials in the Department of EC and E need to prevail. Quotes like what was said in today's Yellowknife newspaper should not be spoken by people in positions like assistant deputy ministers. It is also very important that one of the first priorities of the new Fort Smith campus is to tear down and replace one of the last remaining residential school buildings. Brennan Hall, which is currently being used as a single student residence by Aurora College. This has to be a priority of the capital plan for the new university for Fort Smith. Mr. Speaker, I know that new infrastructure on three campuses will be sought after and constructed eventually, but I feel it is important to reiterate that the main campus and headquarters for the university will remain in Fort Smith. Given the May 30th meeting, I feel it is also very important that the minister himself provides some clarity on what that meeting was about and to explain it and or how that will change Fort Smith's position as the head campus. 
Fort Smith has been the education center of the NWT for generations and will remain so with the new university, as far as I'm concerned. I, um, Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to conclude my statement. Thank you, Member for Thabacha. The member seeking unanimous consent to conclude her statement. Are there any nays? If there are no nays. You may conclude your statement. Mr. Speaker, people have got to realize that prosperity of a new university has got to be shared across the three existing campus locations, but especially for the ones outside of the capital region. The benefits of the future polytechnic university cannot solely be gained by the capital. I just wanted to make that very clear today, given the information that came out on Monday. I will have questions for the Minister of Education later today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabacha. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Framley. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Three months ago, I asked about the attempts to sell the Mactung mining property and any lessons learned from that process. The ITI Minister said, quote, I'm very hopeful that we'll be in a position to report back positively in short order, end of quote. That didn't happen. Another attempt to sell the so-called critical mineral property has failed. This came to light with an uh, April 4, 2022 Supreme Court of British Columbia filing by the appointed monitor for the property. There was no notice or communication from the minister of this latest attempt to sell the property until the media picked up on this court filing at the end of April. The owner, North American Tungsten, went into creditor protection on June 9, 2015, after GNWT agreed to take on this operation under the devolution agreement and allowed that company to keep MacTung uh, property as part of its financial security for its water license. As part of the creditor protection proceeding, Cabinet ended up purchasing MacTung for $2.5 million with a special warrant that bypassed the Legislative Assembly. A lot of junk and hazardous materials were left at MacTung, even though I'd been told that there was nothing there. GWT then spent $172,000 on a partial site cleanup of that property. Then GNWT hired a Southern consultant to prepare and submit a land use application to the Yukon government for an imaginary exploration program in an attempt to hype the value of the property, which also seems to have failed. When I asked the minister about any lessons learned from the mismanagement of Mactung, she said that GNWT is, quote, working together to market the properties and share in the costs of doing so and now work together with the indigenous governments of the region as we proceed to a point where this is hopefully a final and solid proponent who could take over and move this forward, end of quote. I'd hope to hear something like GNWT would commit to change its legislation to make full financial security in a liquid form mandatory to prevent further public liabilities, something this government has failed to do over the eight years since devolution. It's past the time for the Auditor General to carry out a performance audit of GNWT's management or mismanagement of these resources. Needless to say, there are a lot of questions for the Minister of industry, tourism and investment about MacTung, how we manage this asset and liability and whether we can ever expect to recoup the money spent on it. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Cam Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Auditor General tabled findings on addictions prevention and recovery services. The OAG found that the GNWT did not do enough to provide residents with accessible, coordinated and culturally safe addiction services, including specific reference to aftercare supports. A previous OAG report on the NWT's child and family services found that substance misuse was a factor that put children at risk in 83% of files. The finding is reflected in the accounts of several youth here in Yellowknife. They have shared that though technically they have homes, they resort to homelessness as a safer option because of substance abuse in the home or the need to leave the child protect protection system. Mr. Speaker, our Northern Housing Solutions, or lack thereof, are directly impacting our residents' ability to access homes free of substance abuse and violence, homes that allow them to maintain sobriety, and homes that provide avenues for prevention. Mr. Speaker, 20% of Canada's homeless population are youth between 13 and 24.
That's at least 35,000 Canadian youth experiencing homelessness, and up to 40% of those youth identify as 2SLGBTQIPA+. Many young Canadians experiencing homelessness flip between friends' homes, shelters, and the streets. But Mr. Speaker, Yellowknife might be home to Canada's Arctic's only youth-focused homelessness solution called Homebase YK. Every night, Homebase opens its doors and offers a night of safety and warmth to roughly 20 NWT youth. But these beds are not enough and some youth, predominantly girls, are forced to choose the streets. Mr. Speaker, across Canada, many youth experiencing homelessness were also in the care of Child Protection Services. The North is no different. Leaving the child protection system and transitioning to independent living is a challenging process. It requires government support and an aftercare plan. Across Canada, street-involved youth are six times more likely to be victimized, and in the NWT, rates of substance abuse and violence are even higher. Safe housing is a human right at every age. Safe housing is at the core of any aftercare plan. Homelessness exposes our youth to spiraling harms, including sexual exploitation, economic exploitation, traumatic events, declining health, and addictions. Youth-focused housing solutions affording our children safety, security, and the social supports necessary to transition from childhood to adulthood is prevention, Mr. Speaker. Every child deserves to live and grow in a healthy home. Our children need us, this assembly, government workers, civil society, and every person to come together and ensure their right to safe housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Mumphui. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, previously I spoke in this House on inflation and the rising cost of living in the Klitschko region. The increasing cost of fuel is part of the problem. Mr. Speaker, earlier this month, the government announced significant increases to the fuel resupply program prices in 10 communities. Three communities in the Klitschko region will be affected by this increase. Mr. Speaker, this upcoming resupply season, Gamity, Wukwiti, and Wati will see an average increase of 44 cents per liter, or 28 percent increase for heating fuel. 45% per liter, or 25% increase for diesel, and 29%, uh, 29 cents per liter, or 16% increase for gasoline. Mr. Speaker, I am concerned about the impact these increases will, ha will have on my constituents. Without fuel, my people have a limited ability to get on the land. The effects the effects on their well-being, food, and economic security will be immeasurable. Mr. Speaker, often it is, it is those who are the most vulnerable who suffer the most from these increases. I think of the elders seeing a greater portion of their fixed income going towards heating their, their home and, and transportation. Mr. Speaker, I recognize that gas price, gas price increases are a worldwide reaction to the tragic events in the Ukraine where citizens are being forced out of their homes, families, families torn apart, and citizens are being murdered by an oppressive dictator. While I recognize that the GNWT cannot control these fluctuation, fluctuations in global pricing, it is our small community our small and remote communities time and time again that see the worst of the impacts of these price increases. Mr. Speaker, what I would like to, to see for this government to do is to work with us and to work with the Indigenous government to find a solution that will lessen the impacts of these increases on, on our citizens. I will have a question for the Minister of, of Infrastructure at the appropriate time. Thank you, Member for Mumphui. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Yellowknife North. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to substance abuse, two in principles must inform our decisions. That is evidence-based decision-making and harm reduction. 
If these are the driving principles, Mr. Speaker, we will ultimately lower the number of people addicted to drugs and alcohol in this territory. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister of Health spoke today in her statement, I truly believe that she believes these principles are essential to informing our decisions. However, Mr. Speaker, if we believe this, that substance abuse is a health issue, we must remove the criminal law from the picture. Yesterday, the federal government announced that in British Columbia, starting in 2023, small possession of illegal drugs will be decriminalized. BC's Minister of Health, Sheila Malcolmson, in, in making this decision said, stigma and secrecy about substance use kills. She said, shame and fear keep people from accessing the care that they need, and fear of criminalization has led many people to hide their addiction and drug use, and ultimately using alone means dying alone. BC's public health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry said, that criminal risk of being labeled a criminal, losing your job, not being able to get an apartment, not being able to travel, things like losing your children, it keeps people from talking to their family and friends about their drug use, and that keeps people from accessing services. The Federal Minister of Health said BC was the template for other jurisdictions. She will soon rule on whether Toronto gets a similar exemption as they have asked. Mr. Speaker, we have a template to follow. It must be recognized that decriminalization is not a silver bullet. And Mr. Speaker, in BC, in getting this application, had to educate their police on how to properly work with addicts. It had to it had to set out a number of reporting measures and make sure this information is tracked. Very similar information that our Auditor General has recently asked us to do. It had to make sure there was safe supply in place, naloxone in place, and had to increase the number of social workers and treatment available to users. These are not, it is not an easy process, but BC has led the way in truly making sure we tackle the substance abuse issues in this country. I know many feel uncomfortable with the idea. They view it as sanctioning behavior they feel as immoral. They view it as lawlessness that will lead to harm. But that is simply not true, Mr. Speaker. And if we are going to truly help those who are addicted, we must do what actually works and follow the evidence. I have questions for the Minister of Health and Social Services. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, it wouldn't be the right day if that didn't happen. Okay. Mr. Speaker, as I'm sure you're aware, as is everyone else in the territory, based on how my inbox and messages are blowing up, ECE and the City of Yellowknife have announced their intent to consider the parcel of land locally known as Tin Can Hill as the site of the future, future proposed campus of the Polytechnic University. Based on the emails and the posts I'm seeing online, residents appear to be bewildered to hear that once again their beloved Tin Can Hill is being considered for development. In fact, in one email to the city I was CC'd on, the author provided a long list of unsuccessful projects previously considered that had all been shot down by residents want to save one of the few dog-friendly urban green spaces in town. Some residents use the scenic trails in my riding as much as twice a day, five to seven days a week. One comment from social media sums it up perfectly. Tin Can Hill is a treasured recreational area. It's not compatible with the campus, parking, student residence, and the traffic congestion that comes with this facility. Construction will be destructive, subjecting residents to blasting and removal of treasured green space. It'll ruin the area for dog walkers, hikers, runners, cyclists, and tourists. Many residents have voiced concerns and feel that the city needs to stop allowing development pitches to be made for this space." End quote. Since taking office, I've heard concerns about traffic through the residential areas adjacent Tin Can Hill. With the construction of a campus in this area, Copper Sky Apartments will likely become a thoroughfare and affordable housing in the area will become non-existent as Southern students take away our already limited vacancies. Gentrification will force our long-term and Indigenous residents from their apartments they currently call home. Mr. Speaker, I'm not against the construction of the university in my riding. However, I'm concerned about the silo in which this work has been carried out. Clearly, residents have a lot to say on the future of Tin Can Hill. And I have to ask, like I do about my own role as an MLA, why weren't we asked? Thank you. 
Thank you, Member, for Great Slave. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Tunaday Welde. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this spring, the Department of Infrastructure has changed the pricing for heating fuel, diesel, gasoline, and EPA. Since last month, our communities have seen increases between 4 to 48% for heating fuel alone. The diesel price increased between 6 to 41 cents percent. Depending on the community and gasoline salt prices up go up between 5 to 33 percent. The Department of Infrastructure website provides a table with fuel prices by community. Effective May 16, 2022, the price for a liter of gasoline can be as high as $2.40, the price of Cobo Lake, or as low as $1.77 in Toledo. In my Gina Batine now charges customer receiving social assistance and a senior home heating subsidy 13% more for heating fuel. The price in Litsuke increased from $1.38 to $1.56 per liter. Mr. Speaker, the price of petroleum product is different from each community in the NWT. Prices have increased for all Gina Batine customers, whether government or non government customers. Communities are hit hard by this increase. It is also a sudden increase and surprise to communities. We just began to adjust after the pandemic measures have been lifted. The prices hit our communities really hard. Mr. Speaker, our communities did not see this increase coming. Most know that the GNBT resupply their products uh, once a year in the summer. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I that I was, <coughs> I asked that we, are strategic and more considerate of our communities. Let's not create hardship for our communities where we can be innovative and find more reconciliatory approach. I firmly believe that we can work together and find solutions that are not putting a hardship on small communities and that's not meet <coughs> means considering looking at mechanism to subsidize fuel cost. Basic create subsidy or in, in any contribution agreements between governments, including the federal government of Canada, with with focus the goal to leave money in the communities. Mr. Speaker, I will have questions for the Minister of Infrastructure later today. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jerichon. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but you were cut off through a portion of it. So if you could send us uh, your statement, send us an email and we'll have it printed for Hansard uh, under rule 10.4 brackets one. Uh, a good portion of the middle part of your member statement was cut off. So I think the minister has enough information to go on though, uh, but we'll go from there. Member statements, member statements. Returns to oral questions. Returns to oral questions. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Member for Nevik Twin Lakes. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize my constituency assistant, Loretta Rogers, who's here uh, in the gallery and she's escorting the pages from my writing down. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Inuvik Twin Lakes. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Acknowledgements. Acknowledgements. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, these questions are for the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Health confirm what mental health supports are available to those persons impacted by flooding in Hay River? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the member for an opportunity to highlight uh, the, res the uh, responses and supports that are available. I'm sure this has been a very trying time for people in Hay River and more so as time goes on. So um, the community counselling services the member may know is located in the Jensen building. It's open Monday to Friday, 835. No appointment is necessary. Uh, the counselling uh, services are also uh, on call 24-7 during an acute crisis such as the one uh, now. Uh, there are virtual mental health resources available to residents as well, including things such as the Kids Help Phone, Wellness Together Canada, and uh, the Helpline, the, the, the NWT Helpline. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister confirm how many mental health counsellors are on the ground in Hay River and if the Department has sent in additional counsellors from other communities? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Hay River South, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to say we have lots of capacity. There are two full-time mental health and addictions counsellors, one full-time child and youth care counsellor, one part-time practicum student, two community wellness workers, a clinic supervisor for CYCC, and a manager who also sees clients. Uh, two additional mental health counselors are uh, arriving in Hay River from Fort Smith to facilitate community debriefings that are planned for later this week. Um, we also, uh, through HRSSA Communities Counseling Service, um, going to the, um, they attend the um, Soaring Eagle Friendship Center Sharing Circle for any uh, needs that they can support there. So it's, um, it's a well-staffed response. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, will the minister confirm if there will be any outreach services whereby councillors set up meetings with victims in localized areas such as the West Channel, Old Town, uh, New Town, Paradise Valley, and the Reserve? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister responsible for health. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, we respond to requests and we make the services available in those debrief situations to the whole community uh, so that uh, there's confidentiality uh, available. So um, crisis debriefs uh, have been offered to key players in, in the flood response. And there are uh, debriefs scheduled for Friday in the morning and the afternoon at the Hay River Recreation Center. So I would appreciate the uh, member's help in making these known to his community so that people can choose to attend. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary member for Haver South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> uh, I'd like to actually thank the department and the uh, uh, Hay River Health Authority for having people available uh, right off the start uh, uh, to uh, talk to people because what I found is that uh, you know a lot of the people that Im that were impacted they just they needed uh, you know somebody to hear their story so I'd like to thank the department for that and the Hay River Health Authority. Mr. Speaker, will the minister confirm how long we can expect to have counselors on the ground in Hay River to support those victims requiring mental health supports due to the flooding? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister Responsible for Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, that long list of health and addictions counselors, wellness workers, and so on, these are permanent staff in Hay River. Uh, and so they, they are there indefinitely. Um, the additional resources really depend on the demand. Uh, so we are expecting there could be a surge in demand tomorrow after the, or Friday, pardon me, uh, after the community debriefings. Um, at this point, we haven't had um, an overwhelming response to our offer, but the resources are in place and we encourage people who need them to use them. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Kamlik. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my questions today are uh, for the Minister of Housing, NWT. Um, earlier this week, the Minister made a comment to my colleague from Inuvik Twin Lakes uh, that the strategy as it is right now does not come with any dollars for the, the homelessness strategy. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. So I'm wondering, will the homelessness strategy end up coming with dollars once it is tabled, or will it at least be costed? Thank you. 
Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister Responsible for Homelessness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as of today, the uh, housing is working with the social um, development uh, deputies table, which consists of Health, ECE, MACA, and EIA, to come forward with a plan that can be action that identifies the resources required for implementation. Part of the delay is bringing forward a final document um, that desires the social departments to bring forward an approach <coughs> that can be resourced and be successful with its implementation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Kamli. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, across Canada, unique barriers exist for 2SLGBTQIAPA plus youth accessing shelter systems. One in three transgender individuals are rejected from shelters for their gender identities and gender expression. So was or is the Northern Mosaic Network included as a vital stakeholder in drafting this strategy to provide homelessness solutions for our territory? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister Responsible for Homelessness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, much of the work has been done internally um, within the GNW team. The intention of Housing NWT has been that the action plan would provide an opportunity for input on the strategy once tabled, but also that it would include actions that could be put in place immediately while some of those um, border conversations take place. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Kemlik. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering if it's intended to be a fluid document that can be looked at and feedback provided and then changed. Why has Housing NWT, after uh, nearly four years of committing to this strategy, not provided it to the Standing Committee on Social Development for review and input? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister Responsible for Homelessness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in speaking with my, um, with my department, this became a very complex document that identifies uh, several different areas that involves um, several different departments as well, too. So bringing it back, we're looking at um, bringing it to standing committee, I want to say, in, um, in the fall of this year. And I need to see movement on this document as well, too. But once again, once the um, document is implemented, we need to find um, resources to making sure that we continue with the implementation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Kamlik. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the saying perfect is the enemy of good comes to mind here. And sometimes you've got to let something go and let people have a look at it in order to, to get some feedback and let it fly. Because right now, as of today, uh, members in this House have mentioned or requested the homelessness strategy 65 times since September of 2018 when it was first committed to in the 18th Assembly. And it, it is getting frustrated at this point, and I understand that it's very important, but if it sits in housing NWT, it will never get actioned. And so I guess I'm asking the minister now, have any of the resulted feedback or information gained at, by working on this strategy for the last four years resulted in any kind of housing policy changes um, on the front line of housing NWT? Thank you. Thank you, member for Kamlik, minister responsible for homelessness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, there hasn't been any policy changes at this point. As a result of the strategy, the work with all social department um, partners is to ensure that we have an all-of-government approach and to try to avoid um, any unintended co consequences resulting from the strategy. And I do hear the member that this document is taking quite some time, and I want to commit that we would be able to present this document in the fall of this year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Inuvik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, as, my, uh, as I stated in my member statement, my questions are for the Minister of Finance, which Human Resources falls under. Does the GNWT have a document to educate hiring staff on how to measure education equivalencies? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Inuvik Twin Lakes. Minister responsible for finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, certainly anyone that is involved in hiring does have opportunity to access training through um, the Department of Finance. There, there are information packages online um, that can describe some of this, and the Department of Finance is often, if not always, involved 
during a recruitment and retention process so that they can also provide some strategic advice on how to, uh, to do the evaluation of equivalencies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Nevik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister for the response, but I've been in hiring process through the education boards. I've been in health, in other areas, hiring teachers, nurses, you know, and every HR person that I received information of gave me a different way to do it. So there isn't one strategic way or document that everybody does it equivalently through the Northwest Territories. I just wanted to put that on the record. Does the GNWT currently use lived experience and cultural experience into equivalencies? And if not, will the Minister direct her department to find a way to do this equally across the Northwest Territories? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nivik Twin Lakes, Minister responsible for Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is one of the commitments that is under the Indigenous Recruitment and Retention Framework, um, and I, you know, I certainly recognize the, the passion that's being brought to it for exactly this reason that that there does need to be, um, you know, a better way of doing this to to achieve the goals that we have of having more inclusive public service. So uh, it's included already in that action plan. Um, there is the new job description guide I ought to have mentioned in the last response. Uh, the job description guide is meant to be a place where there can be more um, cohesive approach to how in fact job descriptions are being done uh, and where evaluation of, of the combinations of education and experience can be considered and some guidance indeed on how to achieve that uh, through job descriptions now again utilizing that, that, that guide in the context of the, of the, of the framework. So um, once that is now underway, Mr. Speaker, that will you know, be part of the commitments that we've made in that framework and hopefully we'll see success in that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Nivik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and the Minister's answer. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and it leads kind of right into my next question. Well, is the GNWT reviewing all job descriptions to remove barriers and add cultural and lived experience to be measured when a job evaluation, when job evaluation is scoring how they rate the pay? This is something that must be valued in our territory. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nevik Twin Lakes, Minister Responsible for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, it's, it's Action 1.1 of the framework where it speaks to the importance of the job descriptions um, and specifically that all departments and agencies are now expected to conduct a detailed review of all job descriptions, uh, specifically with keeping in mind systemic barriers that may exist. And, and it's, the point is to persist to do that, to, to remove those systemic barriers. Every department and agency is uh, responsible for their job descriptions. They certainly can seek strategic advice from human resources, um, but that is their individual requirement for each department, knowing themselves some of the particularities of those jobs. Um, and, uh, but of note, in terms of when we're going to get there and how they're going to do that, uh, they are now, we are now all collectively expected to be reporting annually, annually excuse me, on the completion uh, of those tasks, including job description reviews um, and performance measures for the framework includes having um, job descriptions reviewed uh, over the next two to three years so that we get through indeed all of them just as is being asked. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Nevik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister, and I'm glad that you added at the end uh, that there is kind of a timeline that these need to be done, so we're not sitting here and, and, and some of our pages are the MLAs at the time asking the same question 20 or 10 years from now. Um, will the Minister commit to creating these documents, like I mentioned in my first two questions, uh, for, for hiring staff? Uh, to measure education equivalencies and cultural and lived experiences into equivalencies and will the minister commit to releasing these documents for the public and hiring managers and any staff that are involved in hiring on their websites to be more transparent and to commit that ensuring that, a, uh, that HR ensures that departments are reviewing all their job descriptions and you said that already so I, I thank the minister for that. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nevik Twin Lakes, Minister Responsible for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there is one resource that I would certainly encourage prospective applicants to take a look at. It is on the website. It's GNWT Hiring Q&A. describes uh, some of the information about who's on a hiring committee, what equivalencies, what kinds of equivalencies might be considered, what that, how that's defined. Um, but it does not go through job by job, providing individual equivalencies. 
Uh, I had the opportunity to speak with the member bef before sitting today. I understand we don't want people to self-screen. We don't want people to think that they won't meet an equivalency and not even apply. That doesn't benefit <coughs> the, the process. It doesn't benefit the public service. You know, the ideal is to have folks coming forward uh, because they think they have the right equivalencies and, th and then we can go through that process of, of the hiring process. That said, Mr. Speaker, I, I can certainly go back and see if we can get a bit more information onto this Q&A uh, so that people have a sense of, of where they stand and so that they aren't screening themselves out and they are applying to jobs to which they'd have a proper equivalency. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Thabacha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Education assure me and the constituents of Thabacha that Fort Smith is still the intended location for the main campus and headquarters of the future Polytechnic University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabacha, Minister responsible for education, culture, and employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since, uh, since the time that our Premier was the Minister of Education, uh, the messaging has been that the idea of a main campus is, is outdated. Uh, we, have, we have three campuses and we have a number of community learning centers that all form one organization. That being said, uh, there is no plan to move the administrative headquarters from Fort Smith to Yellowknife. Uh, I think that some people perhaps you know, saw that there was something happening um, with the campus in Yellowknife and assumed that everything was getting sucked into the capital. Um, that is not the case. Thank you. Sir, oral questions. Member for Thabacha. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister please provide some clarity regarding the meeting that took place on May 30th at City Hall of Yellowknife about the Polytechnic University? What is the intended purpose of that meeting? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabacha, Minister responsible for ec and &E. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the, the City of Yellowknife, uh, ECE and Aurora College have been working together uh, to you know, identify a site for the future Polytechnic uh, University campus in Yellowknife. If anyone is familiar with the current campus in Yellowknife, you would know that it is um, small, it's cramped, it is uh, in, a, in a location that is inconvenient for many people, uh, there's limited parking, uh, and uh, there's no uh, p possibility of growth there. Uh, and, and so there is a need for a new campus in Yellowknife that has been um, you know, discussed many times here, uh, and there are also needs for new infrastructure in other, the other campus communities of Anuvik and Fort Smith as well. Uh, the meeting uh, that took place uh, with the city of Yellowknife uh, was uh, to discuss the MOU between the city of Yellowknife, Aurora College, and ECE regarding uh, the Tin Can Hill site as a potential future site uh, for that campus. and. Uh, just to, to discuss how everyone can work together to um, work through the process uh, to transferring that property. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Thabacha. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister commit to have ECE and Aurora College staff meet with the Mayor and Council of Fort Smith to have a similar meeting as they did with the Yellowknife City Council? to discuss plans for the future Polytechnic University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabacha, Minister responsible for ec and &E. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A similar meeting uh, isn't necessary because it's not a similar situation in Fort Smith. That being said, I uh, was on the phone with the Mayor of Fort Smith and a number of councillors on Friday discussing this very issue. I wanted to uh, give them assurances that this uh, was not uh, a situation that you know, some people are now assuming that it is, that uh, there's going to be a, a single campus in Yellowknife or Yellowknife is, is absorbing all of the campuses or, or anything like that. I wanted to let them know that this was part of the ongoing process of developing a facilities master plan that will guide infrastructure investments uh, in the Polytechnic University for uh, decades to come. And in order to do that, we need to have sites identified, as well as the needs uh, of the, the Polytechnic and the students identified. Um, but that being said, if, if the, the Mayor and Council want to meet and have a discussion, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, Member for Thabacha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Will the minister commit to provide this house with an updated status on the Polytechnic University at as early as possible time? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Slavacha, Minister responsible for ec &E. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I gave an update last week uh, during, with one of my minister statements, and I'm always happy to discuss this exciting project, so yes, I will uh, provide an update uh, to the House. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Framley. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. My question is for the Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment. I raised the issue of our failure to prevent liabilities at Maktong and, our, uh, and Kantong and our inability to sell this, the Maktong property at least 11 times since I've been in MLA. I can't quite match the 65 times raised by my uh, colleague here, but can the Minister tell us how sh she can improve communications with MLAs and the public on what is happening with this mining property? I'll see Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister responsible for industry, tourism and investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with respect to any sort of sale program or process that, that, that may be underway, it would not be unusual for that to involve confidential discussions, and if that's the case, it's very difficult, if not impossible, um, considering legal obligations to be displaying that out publicly. That said, Mr. Speaker, it, we are consensus government, and there, there is, um, there's been a lot of work done in this assembly in terms of understanding better how to communicate between uh, ministers and MLAs when it comes to um, the development of uh, legislation and the de development of regulations, and uh, perhaps there's an opportunity here to consider how uh, what other processes we might have in place to improve communications on confidential items. Um, we've seen some other communication improvements in that regard here, and so this may well be one of those opportunities to look here and see what, what might be done in the future um, to find avenues by which we can communicate information that may be quite sensitive and have legal requirements or obligations attached to it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Framley. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister for that. Happy to uh, talk with her more about that and uh, get more inf information about Mactung in a timely manner. Uh, GNWT decided to try to market the Mactung property with a Canton mine site with the federal government, but all attempts seem to have failed. Can the Minister explain what is going on with the proposed sale of the Mactung property and when the taxpayers of the NWT can expect to recover their investment? Merci, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake Minister, responsible for ITI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There was a joint decision made um, quite some time ago now between GNWT and Canada to attempt to market those two properties, Kantung and Maktung, together. Um, and that effort was underway to, to have a, a joint um, effort and a joint RFP out uh, for seeking to seek uh, pre-qualified proposals. Um, I believe that is the item that the member was mentioning earlier with respect to the publication on the Supreme, Court's, Supreme Court of British Columbia's court filing um, with respect to that not having yielded any positive results. Um, but there do continue to be discussions um, by the GNWT uh, and we are still remaining hopeful that and ultimately a sale will be concluded. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Framley. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister for that. I'm actually getting more information out of the cabin radio story than I guess what I've heard so far about what the, the process is going to be, but um, these Mactung and Kantung properties are 140 kilometers away from each other by air and 700 kilometers by road. It was always extremely unlikely that some buyer would ever take these on as some sort of a viable mining operation without significant concessions and subsidies. So can the minister tell us what incentives, concessions or subsidies will be offered to sell the Mactung property this time around? I'll see Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister responsible for ITI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I've had it described to me that when the decision was made before my time here um, to purchase the property, that it was thought to, in fact, be a good a good maneuver, and indeed that it would it would, in fact, uh, not have difficulty being sold. So, um, neither, regardless of that, at this point, I will still note, Mr. Speaker, that the two properties, although being 140 kilometers apart, um, were jointly owned previously. They remain high-grade tungsten properties. Uh, geopolitical events and the and the critical minerals and metals discussions suggest that there may well be a good opportunity right now for these particular properties. 
Um, there are no subsidies being offered, uh, concessions or incentives. Uh, there is, of course, the mineral incentive policy that we have that applies for anyone uh, who might be seeking to apply in order for some support to, uh, when they go out to do exploration. But as far as the sale and the RFP process, uh, that is not subject to subsidies, concessions or incentives. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary member for Framley. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister for that. Uh, in my view, the Canton and Mactung saga is another example of post-evolution mismanagement of our resources. When I asked the Minister for lessons learned last time, she spoke about hope for a solid proponent to take over the property. I'm going to try the question again, perhaps a little bit differently. Can the Minister explain what lessons have been learned about financial security and public liabilities from the Canton and Mactung saga? Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister responsible for ITI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, I, I, we are characterizing the, the events differently. I'm, I wouldn't characterize it as a saga, nor would I say that the, the story has ended or is closed. Uh, as I had mentioned at the beginning, there are still confidential discussions underway. Uh, I am still hopeful to have a, a positive update here at the end that might close out the chapter. Uh, and at that point, whether there are lessons to be learned in one direction or another, that would be the time to do that consideration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my questions are for the Minister of ECE. And first, I'd just like to thank my colleague for raising her concerns around uh, this process. Oh, did I not have a mic? Sorry, okay, um, my apologies. Uh, <laughs> uh, was my con uh, raising her concerns around this process. And I'm really glad to hear that the Minister has been having uh, lots of ongoing conversations with uh, Fort Smith and with the city. However, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would have to wonder where my consideration was as this first time I heard about this was through the rumor mill and found out along with the rest of the public. So, Mr. Speaker, I have a lot of questions around this. Uh, first off, could the Minister explain what other locations within the city of Yellowknife have been considered uh, and why why were they not selected and Tin Can Hill was? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Great Slave Minister responsible for Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I understand the Member's frustration. Uh, sometimes the rumour mill gets ahead of uh, government and before there are decisions made, before uh, all of the steps are followed, then information can be uh, shared, uh, information gets leaked, and so th that was the situation. Um, it, it came as a surprise to a number of people, and so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't by design that things were out there in the public before uh, the MLAs were informed. Uh, really, the, uh, the, the, the team looked at everywhere in Yellowknife. Um, there were some requirements that, uh, you know, that were needed, so the space needed to be uh, large enough for future expansion. Uh, there's a desire to have a, a site that would allow for on-the-land learning, um, for cultural spaces, uh, a place that was close to uh, the downtown core, uh, somewhere where all of the uh, you know, facilities could be located together. So these are some of the requirements uh, that we wanted to have as part of this. And uh, you know, for perhaps many of the reasons that uh, there's a long history of uh, proponents trying to develop Tin Can Hill, uh, it's because it's a great site, it, because it has all of those, uh, those aspects. And so it is the, clearly the, the most preferable uh, place for a polytechnic university. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, that could have been answered just as a, an everywhere answer, so um, I would just ask that the Minister please uh, speed up his responses. Uh, can the Minister please tell me when the public consultation began? Um, Mr. Speaker, it seems to be a bit of a, uh, a, a habit that uh, things become a done deal before we're ever asked about them. Uh, clearly, my residents were also, my constituents were also very surprised by uh, this decision, and now many are worried that they will not have an input and it will all just be lip service. So can the minister speak a bit to the public consultation process and when is that going to begin? Thank you. Thank you, member for Great Slave. Minister responsible for ECE. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is a City of Yellowknife consultation process. Uh, from what I understand, it's already began. Thank you. Thank you, minister. Oral questions, member for Great Slave. 
Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Speaker. So what I hear then is that the GNWT and EC itself did no public consultation before they made their decision to go with this site. So uh, I'm really glad to know that our inputs are being considered here. Uh, how much consideration has been given to the fact that the access to this location will be through residential areas that cannot sustain the traffic patterns that a university or college would require? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Great Slave, Minister responsible for EC and E. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as part of the facilities master plan planning, uh, students were engaged, uh, staff were engaged, Indigenous governments were engaged, the city was engaged, and now we are in the, the public uh, portion that is being uh, run by the city. It's a city process. There's be plenty of opportunity for public input in this zoning process. Um, and the types of things that the member is talking about right now, uh, traffic access, those are exactly the types of things that this uh, established public process is going to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when we're done here, I will forward the email that I received and referred to in my statement about the numerous times that Tin Can Hill has been proposed for development and it has been shot down by residents. I am again concerned about the waste of money on this uh, project going forward. As I can tell you from what I'm gauging from listening to residents, they do not want it. And for them to not have been asked, for my constituents to not have been asked, is unacceptable. And again, it's just a matter of this government doing whatever they would like to do. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Great Slave, Minister responsible for education, culture and employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I didn't hear a question there, um, but the asking is happening now. There's actually a process being administered by the City of Yellowknife where public input uh, will be solicited. So th that's what's happening. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Mumfuy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recognizing that global gas price increases due to the Ukraine-Russian war are creating staggering impacts for our communities, what steps, if any, can the GNWT take, uh, GNWT take to soften the tremendous blow of these increases on our citizens? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Mumfui, Minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know, this government is alive to some of the issues in terms of, you know, the rising prices. And we as a government have, um, have done a number of things to be able to help um, the residents in the communities, you know, education, um, education culture has some subsidies, ENR has some subsidies, so we are helping the residents in the communities. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Mumfui. Thank you. Can the Minister commit to looking at all potential actions, including a potential short-term reductions in gas taxes to offset the impact of global price increases when carrying out the next gas price adjustment. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Mumfui, Minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Petroleum Products Revolving Fund Act requires the GNWT to recover all operating costs from the sale of petroleum products. In other words, we are not permitted to undercharge or overcharge our customers for what it costs to provide petroleum products to each community that participates in the program. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Mumfuyi. Thank you. Will the Minister commit to look into further subsidies to stabilize the rising cost of living in small communities or programs to ensure people can get, can get out on the land? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Mumfui, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we can definitely have a discussion with Cabinet on how this government can be able to provide subsidies or programs out there. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, Member for Mumfui. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in yesterday's Auditor General report, it, it became clear that we have to make sure there is coordination uh, in our response to the substance abuse issues in this uh, territory. And, and I think one of those clear lines of coordination is, is the RCMP's role. But I think before we even have that conversation, we have to make sure we're on the same page. So my question for the Minister of Health and Social Services is, does she believe that 
our response to substance abuse issues is first and foremost a health issue and not a criminal one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister responsible for health and social services. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. There's obviously an overlapping responsibility here where justice is primarily responsible for what's criminal and how to enforce that, and health and social services is responsible for what is a health issue and how to respond to that. So um, the um, change yesterday doesn't address the primary concern of health, which is self safe supply of illicit drugs, the amount of drugs and whether they qualify as possession or should be seized is really a justice issue. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Yellowknife North. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I have asked these questions to justice before. The, the, today I directed them to health because uh, the decision ultimately made was by the BC Public Health asking for an exemption to the Federal Minister of Health. And so my question for our Minister of Health is, does she agree with the Canadian Association of Chief, Police Chiefs, 60% uh, of the Canadian public, the overwhelming amount of public health officials, the Federal Minister of Health, the BC Minister of Health, and really anyone who has worked on the front lines that decriminalization is a step that saves lives and is a tool we need to use in our fight against substance abuse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I can't offer uh, an opinion on that. This, um, this is a first in Canada, the de decriminalization of the possession of small amounts of illicit drugs. We're very interested in uh, seeing what comes of this in BC. And of course, uh, because the toll of overdose deaths has been so huge in BC, we are hoping that it is successful in, uh, in helping people to um, to address the stigma of receiving uh, treatment for, uh, for illicit drug use. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I heard the Minister of Health say in her first response that one of the key things uh, to a health response is, is safe supply, and, and this was fundamental and essential to BC being granted this. I, I know Yukon has implemented similar safe supply work. Uh, I'm wondering if the Department of Health has any plans to address safe supply here in our territory. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, I, I want to point out that the situation is very different in the Yukon. They have declared a public health emergency uh, around overdose deaths following uh, a series of deaths right after the new year. Uh, we had three overdose deaths in, in uh, the NWT in the first three quarters of last year, and three is too many. But Compared to the toll that alcohol takes on people in the NWT, uh, alcohol is a much more significant problem, and it's the one that we are addressing with the development of the Territorial Alcohol Strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I am well aware that alcohol is, is, is of a primary concern and issue to our substance abuse issues, but I, I, I think absent action now, we will find ourselves in a similar situation to the Yukon in the years to come. We have seen increasing drug use, and many people on the front lines speak to that regularly. Uh, but my question for, for the Minister of Health is, BC, in, granting this app, er, in receiving this application, uh, the Federal Minister of Health said this is really a template for how to respond to, to the substance abuse issues. So I'm wondering uh, if the Minister of Health will commit to looking at that application and looking at the federal guidelines that they put on BC in regards to reporting into tracking this. I, I want to at least make sure we are aware of what's going on in this area. Uh, because much of the data that BC was required to track is similar to what our own Auditor General has, has asked us to track. So if the Minister of Health could at least commit to, to look at the application and, and, and see what we could learn from that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellen Life North, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the suggestion and I'm prepared to take it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. 
Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Tuna Day Well Day. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm not sure I got your message there that um, you didn't get my comments clear as I, when I was reading it out. So I do apologize for the bad internet services here in the community D low and my other constituent writing if it's okay. Um, Mr. Speaker, the fuel service division buys fuel once a year and stores them in tanks throughout the Northwest Territories. Each summer, the division supplies its fuel storage. Why are customers being charged more in April and May in the community if it's okay when the prices for the government of Northwest Territory has not been increased and it's selling and, and selling fuel bought in 2021? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Tuna Day Well Day, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned to the, the member from Monkey about the um, the, the rising prices in, in fuel here in the Northwest Territories. We do have a Petroleum Products Revolving Fund Act that again requires us to um, recover some of the costs. The wholesale price of petroleum products has increased dramatically, as, as have transportation costs to be able to get that fuel to the communities as a result um, of the price of diesel. So the wholesale pricing, uh, petroleum pricing was volatile during the um, resupply program, and the GW team made reasonable efforts not to purchase petroleum projects when the uh, prices spiked. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Tuna Day Well Day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can, can the minister explain why increases for community government customers, social assistance and senior heating subsidy have increased more than for non-profit customers? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Tuna Day Well Day, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I could ask my colleague why his, <laughs> his costs have increased, but we can get back to the member. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Tuna Day Well Day. And thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Uh, can the Minister explain why this increase was necessary despite the existence of the Fuel Service Division Revolving Fund? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Tuna Day Well Day, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, retail fuel prices are adjusted periodically to reflect the recovery of full laden costs of fuel, including the product costs the transportation costs, commissions from sales, operation and maintenance expenses, evaporation loss and taxes. Those are the reasons, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, final supplementary member for Tuna Day Well Day. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, my next final question will be, is, uh, what can we do uh, this fiscal year to help reduce the fuel prices for the community if it's okay. Um, we just don't want to have another price increase uh, midway through three quarters of this next fiscal year. So um, normally uh, when these uh, fuel prices go to tender, it's all inclusive, but then this year it increased. So I want to know what we could do for next year so that the community is not caught off guard again for another fuel increase, uh, increase in the uh, fuel price. We'll see. Thank you, Member for Tuna Day Well Day, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, um, the capital costs and the financing charges are not recovered from the, the, um, the consumers. So, I mean, that's another um, reason. And what can we do the, to, you know, whether we increase or, you know, the, the fuel costs, the adjustments are made by commodity and by community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the importance and ease of access to goods and services is something many Canadians take for granted, but not so much for small communities in the NWT. 
and more so when there's no highway access south. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Infrastructure confirm what progress has been made on completing that portion of the Mackenzie <coughs> Valley Highway from Wrigley to Norman Wells? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you will recall that back in 2018, the GWT secured $140 million under the Transportation Canada's National Trade Corridors Fund to be able to continue to advance the Mackenzie Valley Highway. This is also a priority of this government. In the time since, extensive work has been done on a desktop and a field studies to gather environmental and engineering baseline data to be able to support the regulatory applications and the environmental assessment. The focus this year is on collection of outstanding and environmental engineering baseline data. We will also continue to focus heavily on engagement to gather public input on the proposed Mackenzie Valley Highway corridor alignment and anticipated uh, construction activities. We have continued to work with SSI through an establishment of an MOU for the project. We've had discussions with the PKFN in regards to how best we can work together to advance these important projects. All this work will inform the developer's assessment report, which we expect to submit to the Mackenzie Valley Environmental Review Board this fall. With regards to the bridges, Mr. Speaker, over the past few years, with extensive work has been done to replace most of the existing water crossings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I thank the minister for that uh, answer. I think I might have just about answered everything here. <laughs> but I'm going to ask anyway. Mr. Speaker, will the minister confirm what is the expected cost to complete that portion of the highway from Wrigley uh, to Norman Wells? And uh, what are the factors driving uh, any increasing costs? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Haver South. Minister responsible for infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, back in 2018, a very high level and general project estimate was developed and put, and put the overall project in the range of about $700 million, Mr. Speaker. Not only was this estimate high, it is now outdated, as the menace, member mentioned in his member statement. We know that many factors have changed since this time, including some of the in, inflationary pressures, labor market conditions, and chain supply issues, to name a few. As the environmental assessment progresses, we will be finalizing the engineering design for construction. These plans will inform detailed internal construction cost estimates, which will be required to inform engagement with Canada for future funding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Haver South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, will the minister tell this assembly what are the barriers to completing the Mackenzie Valley Highway to Norman Wells within a reasonable timeline? Is it rights agreements? Is it money? Is it environmental requirements? Is it GMW capacity? Communities have been waiting too long for year-round access to the south. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South. Minister responsible for infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the submission of the Mackenzie Valley Highway Developers Assessment Report to this Mackenzie Valley Review Board is the next major milestone for this project and will trigger the board's environmental assessment process. We are anticipating the board requiring the full allotment of time available to them to complete the EA, which will see a final report of the environmental assessment to be submitted to responsible ministers for a deci decision in late 2024. Provided this project is given a go-ahead, an additional year would likely be required to gain all the necessary regulatory authorization and permits so we can start construction. As previously mentioned, between now and then, a revised construction cost estimate needs to be developed and construction funding secured. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, final supplementary member for Haver South. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, we know that uh, this project's gonna you know, be uh, south of uh, $700 uh, million. 
So, Mr. Speaker, will the Minister confirm what discussions are taking place with the federal government to access the required funding and supports for the construction of the Mackenzie Valley Highway between Wrigley and Norman Wells? Thank you. Thank you. Member for Haver South, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The federal government has provided significant financial report to be able to help us advance the Mackenzie Valley Highway project through the environmental assessment. There's been meetings at all levels of, to garner support for this project. Support of our Indigenous partners is the key to be able to move forward as well as to secure federal funding. As the EA progresses, we will continue to finalize engineering design plans for construction. These plans will inform an updated cost, a construction cost estimate, which is critical to be able to inform the engagement with Canada for future funding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Nevikton Mix. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my questions are um, for the Minister of uh, Finance. Uh, given some of the answers and thinking of uh, some of the programs that their department offers for manage managers in the training of exactly what I was talking about, hiring processes and things like that, are all managers given the management series program? And if not, who decides that they can take this course if they haven't and are in a management role? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nivikton Lakes, Minister Responsible for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, indeed, uh, all managers do go through the management series program that is mandatory. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Nivik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I hope that they add a course with the new training or the new guidelines <laughs> for uh, equivalencies. Um, how many employees are currently taking the Indigenous Management Development Training Program right now? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Nevik Twin Lakes, Minister Responsible for Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 21-22, there were 13 employees who accessed funding to take Indigenous Management Training and Development. Uh, and to date, in 22-23, we have two applications pending to access this program. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Haver, uh, Nevik Twin Lakes. <laughs> 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 thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. Uh, uh, it's only 13 and only two, and we think about how our Indigenous uh, in senior management and management is pretty low numbers. Uh, how much funding is allocated to this program, and is it being fully utilized? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nivik Twin Lakes, Minister Responsible for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Indigenous Management Training Program can support up to 40 grants uh, at $10,000 per grant. So it is undersubscribed, and I would note, Mr. Speaker, it is actually under review right now for exactly that reason, or for what that's one of the reasons to help increase utilization. Um, I would note, Mr. Speaker, when we started this assembly, the Indigenous Career Gateway Program was also underutilized and is now oversubscribed. So I do believe we can get there with this one too. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Camley. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Correction, this is your final <laughs> number for New Victor Lakes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, knowing that this program, you know, looking at it, it's for people who are working in the department, not necessarily in management roles. And so, my question to the minister is: Has her department? How will her department minister have her department ensure? Now you guys got me all flustered. Department to ensure that this program is raised with Indigenous staff, and to all managers and senior managers to offer it to those interested into their departments, or take an inventory on how many Indigenous staff are interested if there's lack of funding. And, you know, I was one of the first ones to start raising the Indigenous Career Gateway, and I'm going to do this with this program because we're going to oversubscribe it, okay? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Member for Nevik Twin Lakes, Minister Responsible for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me give a qualified yes. Uh, because the program is under review, um, it, it, we can certainly promote the program in its current iteration, but it might be 
um, best to promote the program once it's had its review so that, that uh, staff are indeed getting the very best that is available. Um, but uh, at the same time, all departments are now expected to start increasing their Indigenous representation at all levels. Um, those levels are being looked at and monitored for the targets that, that exist in our business planning process that were put in place as part of the Indigenous recruitment and retention framework. It is in the interest of every department to be maximizing every training opportunity that they have if they're going to hit their targets. So uh, I'm confident we can get some messaging out to that effect. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Kemlik. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my questions are for the Minister of Health and Social Services. Access to addictions treatment for youth is provided through Child and Family Services. I'm wondering why has Health and Social Services chosen to fragment ad adult and child treatment access? Thank you. Thank you, member for Kemlik, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, what we consider in uh, providing addiction services for youth and children is the vulnerability of the population and our ability to support them. So uh, I feel very confident that having uh, that response come through Child and Family Services is, uh, is very important. One of the services they offer, for example, is uh, w when a child um, goes to treatment in uh, outside of the community outside of the territory, um, they arrange for courtesy supervision, which means that there's a social worker where the child is who will check on them, um, connect them to any additional services and make sure the youth is safe. So um, I don't think this system is fragmented, it's set up to assist uh, a vulnerable population of youth, which is different than what adults need. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Kamlik. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, how does Health and Social Services address the barriers created uh, by housing this service in Child and Family Services, given the history of our country and the fear of Child and Family Services? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Kamlik, Minister responsible for Health. Yeah, thanks. I think the, the uh, uh, member is talking to the possibility that uh, discussing addiction for youth would uh, trigger protection concerns. Uh, that, that is not the case at present. Um, if a family approaches Child and Family Services, the first step would be a need, needs assessment, followed by um, uh, the, uh, an offering of different options that the family could take uh, advantage of, and when they choose one, then um, a, a plan is uh, tailored to that family and to the person who needs treatment. We, uh, we're working hard to combat the stigma that um, admitting any uh, difficulty in parenting is going to trigger protection concerns. Uh, we, we are very dedicated to dividing these two issues, protection from uh, prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Kamlik. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, given the request for community-based solutions, what types of funding is available for grassroots programming specifically geared toward uh, youth addictions treatment? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Kamlik, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we've, we've done quite a lot of work in uh, my time um, expanding the number of community-based treatment programs that are available to Indigenous governments primarily and also to community governments. Um, it's really um, driven by those entities about what range of ages they take into their programs. So, for example, we have the On the Land Healing Fund, Community Suicide Prevention Fund, Peer Support Fund, and Addictions, and Reco Addictions Recovery and Aftercare Fund. So, these funds uh, are set up with a focus, but the implementation is really, as I said uh, just now, up to the Indigenous governments, and they can take in the age of participant of, of anyone that they choose. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary member for Kemble. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister speak to what <coughs> harm reduction programs are available to youth in the NWT? Thank you. Member for Kemble, Minister responsible for health. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, harm reduction is, is certainly a, a focus for us. 
and addiction services for youth really mirror the same uh, that is offered to adults. And so just to briefly recap those offerings, uh, there's community-based counselling through the Community Counselling Program or through the Child and Youth Care Counsellors. It's the youth's choice which to access. We have the 24-7 help, uh, helpline through the uh, NWT helpline and then the kids help phone service, which also includes a texting option. We have um, apps that are specifically based, uh, are specifically um, directed to children and families, such as the Strongest Families Institute and the Breathing Room app. Um, we have specialized treatment options for, for youth and children, both in territory and out of territory. And um, then we have, as I just mentioned, the community-based wellness programs. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Colleagues, our time for oral questions has expired. Written questions. Written questions. Member for Mumfui. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Delivering equitable education services to small communities in the Northwest Territories. In response to the Office of the Auditor General 2020 report on early childhood to grade 12 education in the Northwest, in Nor in the Northwest Territories, the Department of Education, Culture and Employment committed to action towards improving student outcome in the NWT. It has been since, it has been two years since ECE responded to the Auditor General's recommendations and committed to take action to support schools in, in small communities and ensure students in that ter territory have an, an equitable learning experience. I submit the following questions to the Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. One, how does the Department of Education, Culture and Employment identify what is required to provide equitable access to quality education for all students in the Northwest ter Territories and provide the approach chosen and identify the, the uh, applicable policy document. Mm. I need some water. What action has the Department, Department of Education, Culture and Employment taken since the 2020 Auditor General report to support schools in small communities and ensure students in the ter territory have an equitable learning experience indicating which actions are on hold and delayed, providing the reasons for the status and indicating the partners involved and the amount spent or planned to be spent by activity. How does, how does the, the Department of Education, Culture and Employment know that it meets students' needs in small communities, including needs for specialist services? How are the needs identified, measured, monitored, and reported? And what are barriers and problems in data collections? Four, how is the Department of Education, Culture, and Employment considering the socioeconomic diversity and residential school legacy in small communities in its approaches to providing education services and collaborating with communities explaining which action services and funds are explicitly targeting small communities and the distinct socioeconomic situation and legacies. For example, are actions like providing food allowances or liaising with housing NWT considered? And five, ha has the department considered designing a targeted approach to improving students' outcomes in small communities within a set timeline that may inclu include partnerships and allocate funds to support students, students based on needs? And if yes, will that approach be action upon? And if not, why not? Thank you. Thank you, member for Mumfui. Written questions, written questions. 
Returns to written questions. Returns to written questions. Replies to the Commissioner's address. Replies to the Commissioner's address. Petitions. Petitions. Reports of committees on the review of bills. Reports of committees on the review of bills. Reports of standing and special committees. Reports of standing and special committees. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Minister responsible for the Workers' Safety Compensation Commission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to table the following three documents. 2019 Annual Report, Workers' Compensation Appeals Tribunal Annual Report. 2020 Annual Report, Workers' Compensation Appeal Tribunal Annual Report. And 2021 Annual Report, Workers' Compensation Appear Appeals Tribunal Annual Report. Must see it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Member for Framley. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I wish to table the following document, a report on map staking for minerals obtained pursuant to an access to information request entitled Report on Jurisdictional Scan and Geomatics, Geomatics Analysis by Archibald Robb Consulting and Aurora Geosciences Limited, dated uh, September 28, 2021. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Notice is a motion. Notice is a motion. Member for Camlick. Mr. Speaker, I give notice that on Friday, June 3rd, 2022, I will move the following motion. Now, therefore, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member for Yellowknife North, that this Legislative Assembly calls upon the Government of the Northwest Territories to create a comprehensive strategy to match Canada's population growth, and further that this strategy aim to sustain the population of each community and grow the territory's overall population by 25% by 2043. And furthermore, that this strategy is linked with a goal to add at least 3,700 new homes, or 25%, 20, by 2043, and an update to each community's housing plan to make this a priority. And furthermore, that this strategy bring together existing policies, programs, and campaigns aimed at keeping residents in the north and attracting new residents. And furthermore, that this strategy include an analysis of what brings people to the north, an analysis of what keeps residents in the north, a plan to address the increasing cost of living to keep residents in the north, an immigration strategy, a communication strategy to attract people to the north, and a review of business programs to help residents establish and grow their business in the north. And furthermore, that the Government of the Northwest Territories provide a comprehensive response to this motion within 120 days. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Camley. Notice is a motion. Notice is a motion. Member for Thabacha. Mr. Speaker, I give notice that on Friday, June the 3rd, 2022, I will move the following motion. I move, second by the Honourable Member for Hay River North, that when this House adjourns on Friday, June 3rd, 2022, it shall be adjourned until Friday, October 13th, 2022. And furthermore, that at any time prior to June 3rd, 2022, if the Speaker is satisfied after consultation with the Executive Council, and members of the Legislative Assembly that the public interest requires that the House should meet at an earlier time during the adjournment or at a time later than the scheduled resumption of the House, the Speaker may give notice and thereupon the House shall meet at that time stated in such notice and shall transact its business as if it has been duly adjourned to that time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabacha. Notice is a motion. Notice is a motion. Colleagues, before we proceed, we'll call a short recess. Thank you.
Welcome back, colleagues. Motions. Motions. Member for Ditchu. I see, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> whereas half the population of the Northwest Territories is Indigenous, and whereas there are 33 communities in the Northwest Territories, and whereas there is one capital, six regional centres, and 26 small communities, and whereas Indigenous peoples make up the majority population in the small communities, and whereas Indigenous peoples were subjected to colonization and genocide, and whereas the legacy of colonization is embedded in the health and social services system as systemic racism, <clears throat> and whereas Indigenous peoples are forced to experience systemic racism in the health and social services system, which is a significant contributor to lower health outcomes. And whereas indigenous peoples suffer disproportionate health inequities as a result of a lack of access to quality health and social services care, where cancer and other chronic diseases that are misdiagnosed. And whereas those indigenous peoples who have cancer and other chronic diseases that are misdiagnosed suffer and die prematurely. Now, therefore, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member for Tuna Day Welladay, that this Legislative Assembly calls upon the Government of the Northwest Territories to provide increased access to physicians and medical specialists to offer quality care, diagnosis, and second opinions. And further, the Government of the Northwest Territories prioritize cultural safety, trauma informed care, and anti Indigenous racism professional development training within the health and social services workforce, including locum doctors. And furthermore, the government of the Northwest Territories provide additional training to nurses, healthcare workers, and locum doctors in the small communities on the detection of cancer and chronic illnesses. And furthermore, the government of the Northwest Territories conduct quality review on the health centers in the small communities, including an external audit of client treatment records and client satisfaction. And furthermore, that the government of the Northwest Territories provide a comprehensive response to this motion within 120 days. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Ditcho. Motion is in order to the motion. Member for Ditchu. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise on to give points uh, related to my motion and the reasons for it. Um, I came to the 19th Assembly with intent on improving health care in the small communities, and especially in my community when I went out uh, campaigning and I was hearing all the stories. Um, uh, regarding health care, um, there were many instances and complaints, lack of compassion and seriousness of illnesses. Uh, many patients, well, they, they became patients after numerous visits to the health center for the same ailment. That was about three, four, five times, and each time they were sent home with the Tylenol. Um, this led to medevacs after about third, fourth or fifth visit, in which case the patient was seriously ill and in great danger for their lives. There are instances where patients did end up losing their lives. Many were due to misdiagnosis of their ailment or total disregard of their problem. They're, and they're also being sent home without any follow-up whatsoever. I realize that small community health centers are not equipped with the appropriate medical devices to properly diagnose an unknown ailment. This is an increasing dilemma, and residents have grave concerns of this situation. 
I have made several statements to this situation over the course of this assembly since I've been here. Um, and I believe that it's not a new issue. I, I believe that it's been brought up many times in the previous assemblies. And after the statements and, and all these complaints and everything, uh, there's still uh, no actions nor intent, any intent to action to address these concerns. There was more of the fill in a complaint form, is all you know, people are receiving. I just want to note that we as MLAs are the voice of the people. And when we come into this house, we bring forth all those concerns. We shouldn't have to look for consent form. These are real lived experiences. We, I live in a small community. I experience all this. I bring it to the floor of the house. Something should be done about it. That's what we expect on this side of the house. We need someone to listen to us, to help us. And there were also, you know, several news stories. There was the stories of the ladies in Fort Rez that brought up concerns. You know, there's lots of concerns. And there was also the one, uh, the recent one from uh, the Delana Elder. Uh, and we know what happened there. It was newsworthy. So, so it is a serious concern. You know, we expect you know, from all these concerns, not to fight us and make us think that it's not real. We would expect to get respect from ministers who say, okay, hey, I will come into your community, I will meet with your leadership, I will listen. Because there are many complaints you know, I, I've had to deal with many. I made statements galore on, this, on these issues, and I finally figured, well, I better put a motion in and see what happens there. I'm hoping for concrete action from the department by way of this motion. And that's all I have for now, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Ditcho. Motion is in order to the motion. Call on the seconder, Member for Tunaday Weldon. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I support this motion. Um, just thank you. Feedback. <laughs> Sorry about that, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just want to see, uh, in speaking to the motion, that the issues that uh, I've been raising the um, last little while has really hit home. And I've been dealing everything from mental issues, mental health issues to suicide, to um, medical travel. And the, the things that really makes me think is that, you know, a lot of this stuff could be easily fixed if we went back and take a look at some of the policies that are in place that are prohibiting um, some of these problems we're having in the community. I think it's an easy fix if we went back and take a look at it. But the issues in the community are alive and well up and down the valley. And I've been hearing from a lot of people and feedback on this issue. And I like to work with the, the Minister of Social and Health and, and uh, see what we could do to uh, look for solutions to these problems we're having in our community. And uh, when I was asked to support this motion, I agreed to that. And uh, I'm just asking that if there's a way where we could all work together 
and to look for solutions so that we can provide better outcomes and and health issues in the communities a lot better and uh, so that we're not able to uh, say no to uh, or get back to the families that are asking for help and then let them know that I'm sorry we get you know this is what happened I'm just saying that you know this is a good time to come together um, and then in terms of spirit and intent you know and I'm asking that maybe uh, with this motion that we look for a solution to some of these problems so I just want to uh, just leave that there Mr. Speaker and uh, and Masi. Thank you member for tuning day well day motion is in order to the motion member for here for south. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I didn't really have any comments, uh, but I guess listening to my colleagues and uh, reflecting on, you know, some of the people I know, some of the things that have happened in the past. Uh, you know, my own sister, for instance, she was, uh, you know, diagnosed with cancer at, at the last minute after two years of going to doctors, and you know, and passed away, you know, uh, two months after that. So, you know. The issues here are, you know, small communities and uh, and even regional centers and, and whatever. But I think it comes down to uh, to uh, you know indigenous peoples. You know, we have like there's lack of doctors, lack of nurses. Uh, we have restrictive policies. We see misdiagnosis. Uh, we have you know there's lack of culturally appropriate services, <coughs> lack of understanding of indigenous peoples. Uh, you know there is some racism as well. And all this affects the way, you know, uh, uh, medicine and health is, is dispensed. And I think that, you know, it's time that we took a hard, a hard look at how we're, you know, how we're treating and, uh, you know, the people of Northwest Territories when it, when it comes to health. Because, you know, like I've always said, we've got one life to live. And I think it's very important that, that you know, we do everything we can, everything in our power, to make sure that every person is treated with respect and gets the, gets the help they need. Again, you know, this government is in charge of health. This is where the dollars come. People have nowhere else to turn. And, and uh, you know, when, when uh, they start coming to us, you know they're lost. You know, they, you know that we're probably their last, you know, their last hope for some type of help. So, you know, I support it and, and therefore I, I support this motion and, uh, you know, and I, and I think we all see that there's, uh, you know, uh, pitfalls and downfalls uh, within, within uh, health care for Indigenous peoples, but there's uh, pitfalls and, and downfalls in, in all areas and, and this is one of them and this is an important one because, again, it's a matter of life and death. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South. To the motion, member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I may not be a small community MLA, but what I am is an MLA that listens. And as a result, I do speak with a lot of people from across this territory who share with me their stories. And oftentimes I'm told that they've been told to come to me because their own member doesn't listen to them. And as a result, I've now find myself in a situation where because I care so much about the people in this territory that I'm struggling to deal with the stories that I'm hearing and the trauma that I'm hearing our people are experiencing on a daily basis. And when it comes to medical care and health care, there is nothing scarier in the world than facing a medical crisis and it being unknown. Mr. Speaker, I've been in that situation time and again, and I'm currently waiting in that situation. However, I can't imagine now being someone from a small community and being turned away when I come to say something isn't right and I don't feel well. So Mr. Speaker, I've stood up here before to stand in support of my small community colleagues. I will stand up here again today. As they spoke, I sat here and nodded along. Everything that they've said, I feel in my heart. I'm sure the rest that continue on to speak after me, I will feel the same way. I couldn't support this motion more and I thank my colleague for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Great Slave. Motion is in order to the motion. Member for Nevik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I too am um, in support of this motion. Um, as everybody here knows, my past experience I, as a registered nurse, I'm still a registered nurse. I'm, you know, I have many 
past colleagues who've worked in these health centers. I've sat in hiring committees that hired nurses, you know, in these small communities. And these nurses are trained to be, most of the nurses that are trained in the communities are hired. They're trauma nurses. They're emergency nurses. Some have community health experience. But because of the lack of nursing experience, they mostly are trauma ICU you know, nurses because they need to be able to deal with the emergencies in the health centers as they come, as they're the only ones there to deal with them. You know? And I've raised this in the past that you know, in our small communities, we don't have specific designated home care nurses, health promotion nurses, public health nurses, mental health nurses. We don't have them. That one nurse is everything. And when you're dealing with a community that is short staff, you know, the nurses are, I know that they're probably, they're working, they wouldn't become a nurse if they didn't care. But there is a difference between being in a health center and working overtime, constantly tired, patients coming in, you know you don't have the equipment that is needed. You know, I, I don't know if there's more that we can do, but you know, the thing is, is I think there's a barrier when it comes to medical travel. Because when we talk about some of these appointments or some of these, these clients that are going to the health centers, you know, they can't just ask for a second opinion when there's only one nurse there and the other one can't come in because they're, they're on downtime and they're on mandatory downtime, you know? They can't get a doctor's opinion right now. So we're not allowing them to fly in to see doctors, especially, you know, when I think of the studies that have been done in the Clavic and in the, in the SAW 2 on all the cancer, because the high rates of cancer coming out of those communities. And now we're seeing, you know, like my colleague said, you know, the gentleman that went to the news that said it was so too late, you know, he arrived too late. The reason a lot of our people arrive too late is they don't have trust in the healthcare system. They don't go to the healthcare. I lost an aunt because she refused to go to the doctor, and when she finally went to the doctor, she had end stage cancer, you know? I have family members that are dealing with cancer. You know, I've got ongoing family members who have been able to access cancer treatment early because they live in a regional center. But you know, Mr. Speaker, in these small communities, they don't have that. They don't have an advocate sometimes too that they can go to. You know, we've we've stepped ahead and we've got these senior um, Indigenous patient advocates in our hospitals. We need to do more. We need to make sure there's advocates in our communities or that there's a reasonable place for them to access these advocates to support them. Because, you know, when, I, when I'm asking for an elder to, this is the complaint, I'm bringing it forward, and I'm told, well, they can do a complaint through this. Well, they don't use email. And majority of our elders, our Indigenous elders, when we say we got to do this, we got to do this, you know, I, I hear, ah, never mind, it's okay. You know what? That's what they do, and then they get sicker. You know, I mean, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, your own community has a nurse once a week and during breakup and freeze up. You know, we know that this is a problem in our small communities that our patients, our clients, our residents are not able to just access any care. And, you know, I, I fully support my colleague on putting this motion forward because. You know, I know we can't put a doctor in every community, but what can we do to support these nurses and these community residents so that they are being able to access the care in a culturally safe way and try to make sure that they're being heard and they're not being turned away or as if they feel. Because I can't, you know, that's the thing is, Myself, even if I was working in a health center, you know, and I did something, a lot of times people don't sit down and explain everything that they're doing. It's such a rush. We need to take that time with our, our clients. They don't understand. They're afraid of the system, and they won't ask questions. It's not polite. We don't ask questions. We just let you do what you got to do, and we'll get out of your hair. You know, that is, especially with elders. So we need to understand that culture. We need to sit down and explain and ask them if they understand and give them their options. What if they don't agree with what care that they're getting, what their options are. You know, these are the things that we need to make sure. And this motion will hopefully start to turn 
the department's way of looking at how we can support small communities better. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nevik Twin Lakes. Motion is in order to the motion. Member for Mumfui. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, um, I do feel the same, and I do support the motion as well. And I know that it is about time, Mr. Speaker, that we start um, paying attention to small communities, give them some recognition that they do lack a lot of services, especially in health care. It needs attention. It needs to be improved. We have, some, we have some communities with no nurses or some do not have any health center. So that needs to be, t uh, so we need to recognize those communities as well. There are people living in those communities. And people that are living in the communities are, are mostly indigenous. So that's why I do support and we do need to, we need to do something about it, Mr. Speaker. And as a result of the lack of um, health care, a lot of ser services that were lacking in the communities, a um, lot, of, lot of community members are moving away. For example, um, dialysis. We have some community members that are relocating from their community, wherever they are, from maybe from Tuck, from Gamity, wherever. Um, they are relocating to Yellowknife to have access to that dialysis machine. And these people are moving away from their family, from their home, from their culture, their tradition, their language. I mean, that's another uh, burden on these, um, on these people who are not used to those lifestyles. So for that reason, I really do support. And I'll tell you that too, I do agree. Tylenol are overprescribed in many of the communities. And I also do have some community members. Talna could not fix the problem that they were going through. By the time they paid their own way to get to Yelna, it was too late. They, they already had st stage four cancer. So things like this are happening too often. So I think that it's, it is about time that we have a lot of um, services. We need to improve the services in the healthcare system, in healthcare system in the communities. Um, I cannot stress it enough that we need to do more for the small communities. If not, more of those community members are going to move to Yelnik, and they are going to become your responsibilities, the Yelnik MLAs. So are you guys ready to receive them? If not, then we need to do something about the small community health care system. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Mumfui. Motion is in order to the motion. Member for Frame Lake. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the uh, mover, the member for uh, De Cho, and the seconder, the member for Tunade Welliday, for bringing the motion forward. Uh, uh, I want to acknowledge what I've heard uh, from small community MLAs over my six years as a, an MLA uh, here in the House and in committee about uh, issues around uh, health care in small communities. Uh, at the same time, though, I want to recognize the work and initiatives by the department and the staff. I think we are doing some things in these areas. Uh, uh, you know, we've worked together to get uh, funding for Indigenous patient advocates. I know the department is uh, working on that cultural safety. Change is slow, but I think this motion uh, is, uh, is another step in uh, making the change that we all want. And I look forward to the response from our uh, uh, the other side from our cabinet colleagues. Must see Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Motion is in order to the motion. Member for Cam Lake. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I too would like to thank the member for the day show for the hard work that he put into this motion and for bringing it forward here today. Um, I want to reflect on something that the member for Monfui said, and the member for Monfui reflected on uh, services not being available in communities and, and the result of that hollowing out small communities. Hollowing out small communities is not true reconciliation. True reconciliation is ensuring that Indigenous communities have the services that they need and the resources that they need to continue to 
practice their culture and to continue to be in the north and to continue to be in their home communities. A lot of the work that this assembly is doing is trying to create that space for communities to continue and communities to thrive. And so healthcare is a huge part of our communities and access to healthcare is so incredibly important to our communities. One of the things that, that uh, in social development we hear most often is about services and resources being culturally safe. And that goes beyond uh, the way that policies are, are written. It, it is in how people and what they are saying is received and how they are listened to and how that support is provided and heard. And what I'm hearing here today is my colleagues saying that it's not okay and that their communities are not being adequately serviced and resourced, especially when it comes to health care. As our population ages, Mr. Speaker, we're going to see more and more chronic illness in our communities, and so this is an opportunity to listen and receive what MLAs from small communities are saying to us and to make changes to get it right. This motion is an opportunity to listen, receive, and reflect and be leaders in remote Indigenous health care in the Northwest Territories, and we owe it to the people of the Northwest Territories to do better if that's what they're asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Kamlik. Motion is in order to the motion. Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank all of my colleagues for speaking to this motion and bringing it forward. I just also would like to rise in support. I think it, it is clear that many in our small communities uh, don't have trust in our current health care system, and I think we always have to keep that top of mind. I, I'm well aware that in many ways, health is as, as by far our largest budget, and it, it is going through a deficit reduction exercise right now, and I fear when we look at models that we've seen in other jurisdictions, rural health care is always a potential target of that deficit reduction. Closing health centers is, is, has happened in many areas across other jurisdictions, and I, I think this motion is just a reminder to health that we have to adequately resource to make sure that our health system is equitable, and that's going to take some hard conversations about other budget priorities, but our small community health care cannot be at the expense of that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, or Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Motion is in order to the motion. Member for Thabacha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too will get up in uh, support of the motion. Uh, this motion is to address the health care deficiency in small communities. The access to doctor specialists must be addressed. Uh, personally, I've always addressed each concern brought to my attention from my own constituents to the Minister's office. And I just want to mention that 99% of the answers is, uh, in the replies have always been uh, positive. And I want to thank the, the Office of Health and Social Services for that. The D Indigenous file for small communities is extremely important. And the leaders at all the uh, former meetings in my 14 years of, as Chief of Salt River have always brought this to the table, especially at the Denny Nation meetings uh, and Métis Nation or any of those. Uh, and I want to thank uh, MLA Bonnerus for this motion. And I know it's very dear to your heart. And uh, for that reason, I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Thabacha. Motion is in order to the motion. Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the points that are being made today. Um, it is a priority of the health system to ensure that people have equitable access to safe and effective uh, health care. I know that isn't the case all the time, uh, but all the time is certainly what we are striving for. It's important to say that we are facing an unprecedented crisis of staffing in our healthcare system. We have vacancies across the board. Uh, we have uh, coming out on Friday our Health Human Resources Plan, which uh, will discuss uh, some of the medium and long term um, initiatives that we plan to take to increase staffing. But in the short term, it, we are still very short-staffed, and I anticipate that that will continue through the summer. Um, this is being portrayed as a racial issue. 
uh, and I understand why that is. I, uh, I've done the Living Well Together training, and so have 92% of my colleagues in the department and 61% in the uh, health authorities. And there is a segment of Living Well Together that deals with um, the trauma that was caused by what were then called Indian hospitals, where people went usually for tuberculosis treatment and often stayed over the very long term until uh, they felt they were strangers to their communities and, and cultures. So we have a division within the Department of Health and Social Services called uh, Community Culture and Innovation. It is staffed primarily by Indigenous uh, people and uh, I feel that they have done uh, good work over the last nine years to assist us in understanding systemic racism and developing materials that uh, help us to become uh, culturally safe in, in the interactions that we have. I want to say that um, the health and social services uh, authorities were accredited in 2019 following an extensive process of both internal and external review and that the next review is scheduled for next year. We, we provide surveys. Uh, they are online. I heard that people uh, don't uh, always use online. But um, we have uh, recently closed the patient experience questionnaire, and I hope that we'll have some good learnings from that. Um, we recently um, put out our community counselling questionnaire and I was very pleased to uh, learn that 73% of uh, the people surveyed um, who, who completed the survey were satisfied or very satisfied with the care they received. So Mr. Speaker, um, we, uh, we hear the, the concerns that are raised here. Uh, we will provide a response to the motion. Today, the Cabinet will be abstaining in this vote. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Motion is in order to the motion. I will allow the mover to do closing comments. I thought it was after the vote. You could do closing. All right, Masi, Masi Cho, uh, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> I would like to uh, say a big Masi to my colleagues for their unwavering support for small community issues. This is about the concerns, you know, of the residents of, uh, of the Northwest Territories. The many people that have been affected <clears throat> by the lack of quality health care. That is the big issue. It's not a questionnaire. It's an insult. And I really hope there's sincerity on that side of the house for our issues, because it won't go away. We understand there might be shortages, but there's always that trip you can take to Ottawa, because health care is supposed to be looked after by both the governments, GNWT and the federal government. And we need the ministers on that side to really to really hammer home, home that, that issue in Ottawa. You know, this is about the concerns of the residents of the NWT. I'm just a voice for them. It's not about me. I don't look for glory or nothing. This is real. I'd like to say Mussy again to my colleagues for all their positive comments and support. Mussy. 
Thank you, Member for Decho. Motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. Members, pursuant to Rule 10.3, brackets 1, a recorded vote is required. The clerk shall call on each member by writing name to cast their vote, starting with the mover, those participating remotely, and those participating in the chamber in the order of their seats. When the clerk calls on you, please state whether you are for, against, or abstaining from the motion. All those in favor, please rise. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, the, the member for Decho. Four. <laughs> Four. The member for Tunaday, Willaday. Agreement. Yes. In favor. The member for Hay River no, South. In favor. The member for Thabacha. In favor. The member for Cam Lake. Four. The member for Frame Lake. Four. The member for Yellowknife North. Four. The member for Montfui. In favor. The member for Great Slave. In favor. The member for Nehende. Abstaining. The member for Yellowknife South. The member for Satu. The member for Range Lake. Abstain. The member for Inuvik Boot Lake. Abstain. The member for Yellowknife Center. Abstain. The member for Hay River North. Abstain. The results of the recorded vote, 10 in favor, 0 opposed, 7 abstentions, the motion is carried. <coughs> Motions. Motions. Member for Kamlik. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Whereas Section 91 of the Legislative Assembly and Executive Council Act provides that the Commissioner, on the recommendation of the Legislative Assembly, shall appoint an Integrity Commissioner to exercise the powers and perform the duties set out in the Act, and whereas the appointment of the current Integrity Commissioner, Mr. David Philip Jones, expired on November 30, 2021, <coughs> And whereas Section 91, brackets 4 of the Act, provides that the Commissioner continues to hold office after the expiry of his or her, her term of office until the person is reappointed as successor, is appointed, or a period of six months has expired, and whereas the Legislative Assembly considers the appointment of an Integrity Commissioner essential to exercise the powers and perform the duties under the Act, and whereas the Legislative Assembly is of the opinion that the appointment of an Integrity Commissioner, effective June 2nd, 2022, should now be made. Now, therefore, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member for Anuvik Boot Lake, that pursuant to Section 91 of the Legislative Assembly and Executive Council Act, the Legislative Assembly recommends to the Commissioner of the Northwest Territories the reappointment of, of Mr. David Philip Jones as Integrity Commissioner, effective June 2nd, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Kamlik. Motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. Members pursuant to Rule 10.3, brackets 1, a recorded vote is required. The clerk shall call on each member by writing name to cast their vote. Starting with the mover, those participating remotely and those participating in a chamber in the order of their seats. When the, cl when the clerk calls on you, please state whether you are for against or abstaining from the motion. 
The member for Cam Lake. Four. The member for Tunaday, Willaday. Four. The member votes in four. The member for Frame Lake. Four. The member for Yellowknife North. Four. The member for Montfui. Four. The member for Great Slave. Four. The member for Nahende. Four. The member for Yellowknife South. Four. The member for Satu. Four. The member for Range Lake. Four. The member for Inuvik Boot Lake. Four. The member for Yellowknife Center. Four. The member for Hay River North. In favor. The member for Inuvik Twin Lakes. Four. The member for Decho. Four. The member for Hay River South. In favor. The member for Thabacha. Four. The results of the recorded vote, 17 in favor, zero opposed, zero abstentions. The motion is carried. Motions. Motions. Notice is a motion for the first reading of bills. Notice is a motion for the first reading of bills. First reading of bills. First reading of bills. Second reading of bills. Second reading of bills. Consideration and Committee of the Whole of Bills and Other Matters, Bill 23, 29, and 40, Committee Report 30-19, Brackets 2, Table Document 657-19, Brackets 2, Table Document 658-19, Brackets 2, with Member for Inuvikton Lake Signature. I now call Committee of the Whole to order. What is the wish of committee? Member for Frame Lake. Uh, merci, Madame la Présidente. The committee wishes to consider table document 658-19 brackets 2 and table document 657-19 brackets 2. Merci. Thank you. Does committee agree? Thank you, committee. We will take a short recess.
I'll now call committee back to order. Committee, we've agreed to consider table document 651-192, Supplementary Estimates, Operation Expenditures, Number 1, 2022-2023. Does the Minister have any opening remarks? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I am happy to present Supplementary Estimates, Operation Expenditures, Number 1, 2022-2023. The supplementary estimates propose a total increase of $56.956 million, $32.7 million of which will be offset by revenues from the Government of Canada. Notable items which are partially or fully offset by federal funding include the following. $9.4 million to support early learning and childcare in the Northwest Territories. $7.1 million for activities associated with the Low Carbon Economy Leadership Fund. $5.5 million to continue the transformation of Aurora College to a Polytechnic University. $2.2 million to support the provision of education programs under the Canada and Northwest Territories Agreement on Minority Language Education and Second Official Language Instruction, 2019-2020 to 2022-23. And $2.1 million in support of the Northern Aviation Industry. In addition, these supplementary estimates include the following items which are not offset by federal funding programs. $12.9 million to continue to support flood recovery efforts across the Northwest Territories. $6.2 million to support core housing needs and emergency shelters in the Northwest Territories. $5.6 million to support our health care system as we transition to the endemic phase of COVID-19. A reduction of $2.3 million to contract services and $1.8 million to enhance the capacity of the Emergency Management Organization. That concludes my opening remarks, Madam Chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Minister. We have agreed to begin with general comments. Does the Minister of Finance wish to bring witnesses into the House? Yes, please, Madam Chair. Thank you. Sergeant at Arm, please escort the witnesses into the chamber. Minister, please introduce your witnesses. S introduce witnesses? Sorry, Madam Chair, I can't hear. Um, Madam Chair, thank you. I have Deputy Minister of Finance Bill McKay on my left and Terence Coutre, the Deputy Secretary to the Financial Management Board, on my right. Thank you. I will now open the floor to general comments. Member for Frame Lake. Yeah, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, I have some questions about what's in here, but also something that's not in here. So um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the uh, Minister has uh, carried through with her commitments, as I fully expected, in terms of uh, some increased uh, spending uh, that we had negotiated as part of the budget uh, discussions uh, earlier this year. Um, there is extra money in here for housing, $4 million, uh, $2.2 million for uh, shelters, uh, shelter funding, an increase of half a million dollars for heritage centres. There's some reductions in contracted services. But the area that's not covered in the supplementary appropriation is uh, the increased revenues from uh, a tobacco tax increase. So. Can the minister tell us why that's not included in the supplementary appropriation? I'll start with that. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, it does require a regulatory change, and so that is being worked on at present, um, and we are expecting that those regulations should be implemented by August the 1st. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Member for Frame Lake. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair, and thanks to the Minister for that. I'm just so we passed the budget on it was actually and it was received to Senate, I think, on March 31st, so April, May, June, July, August, five months 
Is there no way we can do this a little bit quicker next time? Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, Madam Chair, uh, these things do take a bit of time. Um, I mean, the, the commitment was made at the time of budgeting, but then, uh, you know, it does have to get, um, the drafting has to get put through uh, the Department of Justice as well as ourselves. And in this case, um, there's an element where we rely on Manitoba for the, it's not, it's not quite a sticker, Madam Chair, but essentially it's something to that effect. So there was just a few steps to be taken. We knew it wouldn't be immediate. Um, and Madam Chair, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing, but I gather there was a question as well with respect to uh, needing to bring back a further stop to appropriate revenue. Uh, we don't need to appropriate the revenue that would come in um, by way of being revenue. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Yeah, okay, thanks, Madam Chair, and thanks to the Minister. I, I'm sure I don't have to remind her that every day we wait for the tobacco tax increases, money that's not captured. But uh, um, I want to move on to the uh, uh, supplementary reserve. Uh, can someone tell me what that was originally set at and where it will stand as a result of this? A set of supplementary estimates. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Madam Chair, this year we had set aside, not set aside, but had um, created a supplementary reserve of $35 million. $35 million. Um, we are down to 10.754 after this. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Yeah, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. So, um, uh, this is the first of a supplementary appropriation for the, the current uh, uh, fiscal year, and I expect that there's probably going to be at least two, maybe three more. Uh, what happens when we exceed that uh, reserve amount, and uh, what does it mean? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, it's, excellent. it's an excellent question. I'm happy to answer it. Um, although the, the news isn't necessarily good, if we res exceed the supplementary reserve, uh, essentially what you're, we're likely to be doing is any projected surplus uh, would likely get uh, dipped into, in a sense. Um, so if there was a projected surplus and we run out of supplementary needs and we continue to have more needs, um, then we're likely eating into that projected surplus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. And as we uh, move uh, eat into the uh, supplementary reserve, that means that there's less money uh, uh, for capital projects, the capital budget, which we're going to get to, um, uh, moving forward as a result of the fiscal responsibility policy. Is that correct? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, yes, you'll recall the fiscal responsibility policy requires that 50% of our capital budget is funded through supplementary uh, or from operations surpluses. So, yes, if there's less surplus available, then there'd be less money to spend in compliance with that policy. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. So, moving forward, would we expect then to... Uh, have a, an increased uh, supplementary reserve. Uh, you know, I, I also uh, note that uh, inflation is running nationally at 6.7% here in Yellowknife, 7.1% uh, April to April. So is this something that we would uh, want to do moving forward is looking at increasing the supplementary uh, reserve uh, so that we don't end up eating into other surpluses or God forbid go into short-term debt. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, you might recall that during COVID, we actually had increased the supplementary reserve to, uh, I believe it was $60 million. So um, that certainly is, it, there is an option to increase. We kept it at 35, which is higher than it traditionally had been. Um, and uh, it may well be that for budget 2023, we want to look at moving back up again. So that, again, certainly under consideration, as I, as I say, that's a number that has moved around during COVID. So thank you for, I appreciate the idea. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Frame Lake. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. That's all I've got in terms of general comments uh, and questions. I'll have some more specific ones once we get to uh, um, the detail. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. General comments? Seeing no further general comments, we'll proceed 
to a review of the supplementary estimates by department and activity committee please turn to page four of the table document legislative assembly <laughs> Legis <laughs> legislative assembly office of the clerk not previously authorized $55,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Committee. Legislative Assembly total department operation expenditures not previously authorized. $55,000. Does committee agree? Nope. Committee, please turn to page 5 and 6 of the table document. Department of Education, Culture and Employment. Education, Culture and Employment, Corporate Management, not previously authorized, negative $12,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Education, Culture and Employment, Education, Culture and Employment, Culture, Heritage and Language, not previously authorized, $340,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Education, Culture and Employment, Early Learning and Child Care not previously authorized, $9,336,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Education, Culture and Employment, Income Security not previously authorized, $1,318,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Education, Culture and Employment, Junior Kindergarten to Grade 12 School Services, not previously authorized, $1,715,000. Does committee agree? Education, Culture and Employment, Labor Development and Advanced Education, not previously authorized, $5,395,000. Does committee... Oh. Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I see that there's $5,470,000 for the transformation to a polytechnic university. Very happy to see that this is 100% federal money. I, I believe there was a couple million in the capital budget previously uh, for some upgrades to the college as well. Uh, but, but I'm just hoping the minister could give an explanation of uh, what we are spending this $5 million on. Thank you. Thank you, Member. Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, can I turn that to the Deputy Minister, please? Deputy Minister Mackay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the money that came from the federal government is spent for the uh, the transformation uh, team that's overseeing the transformation to a uh, polytechnic, as well as some contract services to uh, put together the facilities plan which uh, so they require some specialized architectural and engineering services to put that together as well. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, glad to hear that. And I know the facilities master plan is well underway and there's a lot of work to be done on that. I, I guess my question is, uh, can the minister provide an update whether there's any further money committed from the federal government for the transformation? Uh, you know, I, I think well, obviously there's hundreds of millions needed one day for infrastructure, but uh, I know we're also doing a programming review, which is kind of key to that. And we've actually agreed to re-implement some programs. So I'm just wondering if there's any federal money in the programming area. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, there's nothing currently appropriate that's not uh, well, if it's not showing up here, it's not uh, coming in as an appropriation at this time. Um, I, I think it is probably reasonable to assume that, that more is going to be needed before we get to the point of a polytechnic, but uh, that uh, we'll have to just stay tuned for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. General comments, or sorry, any <laughs> on this section, labor development and advanced education? Okay, so education, culture, and employment, labor development, and advanced education not previously authorized, $5,395,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Committee, education, culture, and employment, total department, operation expenditures not previously authorized, $18,092,000. Does committee agree? 
committee please turn to page seven of the table document department of environment and natural resources environment and natural resource corporate management not previously previously authorized fifteen thousand dollars does committee agree environment and natural resources environmental protection and waste management not previously authorized three hundred and eleven thousand does committee agree Environment and Natural Resources, Environment Stewardship and Climate Change, $379,000. Does committee agree? Environment and Natural Resources, Forest Management, not previously authorized, 800 <laughs> Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering if I've beaten my colleague to asking about this one. Uh, it's my understanding that there is a prediction of a, of a warmer and hotter summer this year, and as a result, probably a higher forest fire risk. So could the minister please speak to uh, how many uh, airplanes are we getting uh, for that $830,000? Thank you. Thank you, Member. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. I understand that this is uh, that, that provides for two aircraft. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Great Slave. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And is are those two aircraft uh, with one uh, company, or will that be spread over two organizations? Thank you. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we're anticipating this is with one um, one company. Thank you. It's for 45 days. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what happens when or if we don't use that money, or is this going to always be spent as a result of just keeping those airplanes on uh, standby? Thank you. Thank you, Member <coughs> Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, quite often the finances would be restricted for particular purposes, but let me just turn this to the Deputy Minister and see if he can uh, provide more detail on this one. Thank you. Deputy Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So the, the department required, uh, at least for this year, to uh, ensure that they had those planes available in case they needed them. Um, and that was because it was apparent that there was going to be uh, a shortage of planes available uh, this season. So they wanted to make sure that they had uh, those available in case, uh, so that they wouldn't be short planes if uh, they needed them. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Madam Chair. So then is it correct to say that this is just the amount of money to hold the planes and then should the planes then be used for suppression, we wouldn't be incurring more costs? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member, Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. M Madam Chair, my understanding is that this is meant to be a contract for the use of those planes for the 45 days. Um, it, it's similar, if you might recall, to, to what was done last year, again, just given you know, what the impacts of COVID were on the airline industry and, in one, and the predictions for the potential for a significant fire season. Um, it, it's not necessarily intended to be long-term in the sense of multiple years, but uh, will provide for the use of the planes for this year. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think one last question. Does that then include like the cost of fuel, all costs in for suppression, or would there be additional sort of uh, materials costs on top of that? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, it is my understanding that this should be the full costing uh, as a, for the use of those airlines for the 45 days. Now, I, I say that with always with just a note of caution that what we're seeing right now in terms of inflation, fuel costs, and essentially all costs around us seemingly rising, um, it's not to say that there couldn't be increased costs to the forest fire season this year. We're certainly very hopeful that it's not. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Great Slave. Maybe you can ask the Minister of Infrastructure then if you can buy fuel from her, since it's always <laughs> steadily <laughs> laid out. No more comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> that is a comment <laughs> or suggestion. <laughs> All right. Environment, natural resources, forest man management, not previously authorized, $830,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Committee, environment, and natural resource, total department operation expenditures, not previously authorized, $1,535,000. Does committee agree? Committee, please turn to page eight of the table document. Department of Executive and Indigenous Affairs. 
Executive and Indigenous Affairs Cabinet support not previously authorized. Negative $20,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Executive and Indigenous Affairs Directorate not previously authorized. Negative $20,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Executive and Indigenous Affairs Executive Council Offices not previously authorized, negative $80,000. Does committee agree? <laughs> Thank you, committee, executive, and Indigenous Affairs total department operation expenditures not previously authorized, negative $120,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Committee, please turn to page 9 of the table document, Department of Finance. Finance Directorate, not previously authorized, $6,190,000. Does committee agree? Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I see there's $6,200,000 increase from, to the Housing Corporation, which shows up in the Department of Finance as a transfer. Uh, my understanding of this money was that it was going to be a permanent increase to the Housing Corporation, so that... Uh, their, their grant from the government, the GG and WT, has been rather consistent for well, almost a decade or so. Uh, so I'm just wondering if this is a permanent increase to the, what we give the Housing Corporation, and, and if so, how uh, is there anything that kind of reflects that in the main estimate or in the supplementary appropriations? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, there, the core program's uh, amount there that you see for $4 million is in t going to be ongoing. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be reflected here. This is a supplementary appropriation to the 2022-23 uh, main estimates, but it should be showing up uh, when we do the review for the 23-24 main estimates and through the business planning cycle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, and then I, I take it that the 2.2 emergency shelter homeless funding may be in a, in a bit more of a question than the $4 million then. My, my understanding is that this, well, this goes to a number of shelters, but one of them significantly was the uh, Arnica, now known as the Spruce Bow in Yellowknife. Uh, I'm wondering if the minister has an update of whether any hope of ongoing funding, whether funding for what next fiscal w would look like for that organization. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, yes, that, um, the, the amount for the emergency shelters was not intended to be ongoing, um, but to help provide some support uh, to the housing corporation so that they, in turn, could support some of the shelters that were in an sort of immediate need um, and to tide them over because it was, it's my understanding that there were federal um, funds that were coming available, but they just weren't ready at the time. So this is, it was meant for one time to get them through what was a difficult cycle. Um, if there is further needs ongoing um, by the next cycle, then that would have to come through a business planning process. This 2.2 million won't, won't be reflected as a permanent increase. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so finance directorate not previously authorized, six million. Oh. Member for Montfuy. Okay, um, thank you. I like here this uh, where it says it's going to go towards um, home repair, emergency repair, fuel tank, and all you know, elders, uh, seniors aging in place. Um, I just want to make sure that you know some of this gets spent in communities, and I hope this funds, this fund that we're going to be approving, will not be used to hire more people to do more planning, studies, et cetera, as mentioned before. So I hope it will get spent in the, in the communities. I would like to see it get spent in communities, in small communities or larger center, in, outside of Yelmick, that's what I'm saying. So I would like to see this get spent out there, then spend, um, I hope it doesn't get spent to hire more people. Thank you. Thank you, Member Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, Madam Chair, the, these funds, and I, and I take note, and I appreciate the note, uh, the comments here, that these are 
um, programs that really one of the reasons I think that they were chosen or targeted is that they um, are funds that are, people can apply to so that they are funds that then are the dollars go out to the communities or to individuals um, who can apply to the funds so rather than relying on what is frankly often already stretched capacity to deliver um, further capital planning programs from within GNBT departments and particularly and including housing here individuals who would like to access the money from any community can do so so I'm, I'm quite happy to have that opportunity to highlight the fact that there's been this increase to exactly that emergency pit repairs fuel tank replacements the home purchase program um, mobility modifications uh, and several others as well senior seniors aging in place etc so um, and I am looking forward to you know certainly this is money that we hope does get spent by individuals in communities across the Northwest Territories thank you thank you finance Directorate not previously authorized, six million one hundred and ninety thousand dollars. Does committee agree? Thank you. Finance human resources, not previously authorized, negative one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Does committee agree? Finance management board secretariat, one million six hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. Does committee agree? Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question about the reduction in contract services here in the Management Board Secretariat. It's, it's rather significant, and I'm just wondering how, what, what contracts we expect to lose from this. I don't really understand what the Management Board Secretariat does, to be honest. And if we don't actually expect to lose any contracts, just if someone could color how we end up, you know, with about $700,000 of surplus in a specific accounting line for this group. Thank you. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, so uh, there are a few things bound up in there. Um, I am mindful of time, but the Management Board Secretariat is an integral part of uh, the Department of Finance, uh, and they provide the strategic advice and analysis that goes into the Financial Management Board to help analyze um, decisions that are being made and help provide us advice when the Financial Management Board meets. Um, there's quite a lot of information about them on the website and I'd certainly be very happy to, to have the member go and look at it because they are an important, they do perform a very important function. With respect to the contract services, and we've already seen a few, this one is perhaps more notable in terms of its size. Um, the, the, the decision that was made around which departments and divisions within them to reduce contract services, uh, the, it's not because there was necessarily a surplus or a known surplus. Uh, the effort was made uh, in concluding the budget discussions with uh, other members, with MLAs, that we'd make these reductions, but that we would try to make them in departments that have historically had the most surpluses as compared to some departments or divisions that actually often do run in deficit and actually need to go back and get more money put in for their contract services and so that's the reason um, why this one here again historically hadn't seen a maximization of it for any specific contracts that might be impacted I would suggest we go to the uh, deputy secretary or to, to uh, mr. Coutre please thank you mr. Coutre thanks madam chair uh, the contract service budget for management board secretariat is really um, one of the main placeholders for all contract services done within the Department of Finance. Um, so by default, it was one of the larger budgets in the department. Uh, we're not expecting uh, that no work or contract services work is going to be foregone because of this reduction. Thank you. Thank you. Finance Management Board Secretariat Member for Tabacha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to question uh, the funding for air carriers for the period of January 1st to March 31st, 22. Um, I understand that there was a million that was put aside for regional airlines that was not spent in the previous year, and uh, the government of the Northwest Territories received an extension for an extra, extra year to get the money out. Uh, is that million dollars going to be spent on regional air airlines? Uh, so uh, the and if you did that, uh, there would be only uh, one million ninety-one thousand that it would be left for the other for the other airlines. Is that correct? Thank you, Minister of Finance. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, so there, there was no extra money remaining in this particular line item. Um, there, there is a surplus that amount in the um, Regional Air Transportation Inici Initiative, or RADI, agreement, which is uh, managed under infrastructure and which I think we'll come to shortly. Um, these funds are specifically were negotiated with the Department of Transportation Canada uh, for really out of COVID relief. Um, and uh, yeah, as I say, there was no, uh, there was no, nothing that wasn't spent um, uh, on, in what we had available. Um, Madam Chair, I think there was another question in there and I apologize, I, I forgot what it was. Thank you, Minister. Member for Tabacha. Um, the government of the Northwest Territories did not spend $1 million of support that was supposed to go to regional airlines uh, by March 31st, 2022. Um, it seems that they, and so they've asked for uh, an extension of an extra year to get the money out. I want to know why these funds weren't spent before March 31st, 2022. Thank you, Member. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Madam Chair, again, um, the Department of Infrastructure does manage the Regional Air Transportation Initiative, or RADI. Um, it's a federal fund that is there to help maintain and reestablish regional air connectivity services across Canada that might have been impacted by COVID-19. Um, it's being delivered by Canor, and that money did not all get out the door. Um, but that is not the same. It's it's not the same money as what Department of Finance manages for the purposes of COVID relief. Um, the 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 RADI money was uh, something that was helping to shore up services, shore up the airports. Um, uh, you know, a, a a bit, essentially, it was really. Um, assisting with things that might come up as a result of COVID-19, but not necessarily relief funding to airlines or air carriers. The F Department of Finance had the airline and air carriers yeah. relief funds uh, that we were managing, and that's this one. And that this came through in four different phases. Um, and this is simply the, the last, the fifth of the phases, and I anticipate likely to be the last of the five, or to be the last, this fifth one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Tabacha. Uh, Madam Chair, it's disturbing to me that um, Canadian North got 46.5% of the contributions that were given. Every other airline across the board, well, it all are less than 10%. And uh, regional airlines, especially the one from Northwestern uh, Air Lease, was 4.1%. Uh, the lifeline to some uh, communities like Fort Smith and uh, um, especially Fort Smith because that's all we have there. Uh, and it was a ma major problem uh, the last time the phase four was brought out and uh, uh, it concerns me that the majority of the monies that go out to these major airlines, uh, ownership is not in the Northwest Territories. Uh, the ownership with Northwestern Air Lease and all the people that live in uh, Fort Smith and work for the airline are all residents of the community of Fort Smith. And, um, but uh, Canadian North uh, ownership is in Calgary. Um, there's other, Summit Air is in Ontario, the ownership. So like, likewise, uh, our government uh, is con constantly making sure that uh, uh, southern interests uh, overrides uh, northern interests. This is extremely important to uh, uh, the people of Fort Smith because uh, uh, we, you know, the, first of all, they, they used to employ about 75 uh, local people that all live there and own homes there and do business in Fort Smith, including the owners. And yet we're sending all this money, 46.5% out of 51 point some million. That's about 25 million or more to uh, Canadian North and ownership is in Calgary. I'm not saying that they shouldn't get money to ensure that the airline still serves the North. But I just wonder where the priorities are. And I'd like to know what the priorities are. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member. Minister of Finance. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, so again, this, this is a program that uh, was cost shared with the federal government. Um, and it was part of funding that was being delivered through COVID-19 and the pandemic um, when airline services across the country were facing fairly dire straits when there was the sort of significant and immediate shutdowns of airline services and impacts to them. Um, the portion that we received was to help maintain air service costs across the Northwest Territories. Uh, it was not, um, the federal government wasn't, uh, you know, supporting which, you know, based on where ownership might be, they were supporting based on where the air services were, were based or being required. Uh, we were able to get some, some flexibility uh, where for other regions there may have been only passenger services that were receiving the funding relief and supports. Um, we were able to demonstrate that in the Northwest Territories there are carriers that service uh, regions and communities that provide essential services, whether it's cargo, uh, medical transport, um, medical supplies, et cetera, and in fact, you know, COVID-related supplies ultimately. So uh, that was the focus of these uh, supports. Um, it was, it was, again, these are, it's not, uh, you know, uh, an economic development opportunity. It was really ensuring that various networks remained uh, alive and at least healthy so that services and maintain and routes could be maintained. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Tabatcha. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, economic recovery starts at home, okay? It wasn't an economic opportunity for a small airline to uh, get some help in the fourth phase and now in the, in the fifth phase. Uh, economic recovery is for those people who live and reside in the Northwest Territories. We are constantly, as, constantly doing the wrong thing when it comes to these kind of initiatives uh, where we're always making sure that the southern interest is always looked after and uh, you know that's that's not okay uh, when you have people in a community uh, like Fort Smith with uh, over 50 employees still there all living and working there spending their money there going to the grocery store and all these other things and uh, our government and uh, this minister decides that uh, the criteria, they don't look out of the box with the criteria. They have a set thing to make sure that they, they look after the bigger air carriers and the, and the uh, ownership is not here. That is unbelievable, unacceptable, and uh, I'm not really happy about that. And I hope that uh, when, they, when they, the amounts come out after we're done this session, like usual, that uh, they take into account this, the regional airlines that actually serve the North and the people that are living here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member. Did you have any question for the Minister? Questions. Finance. Management Board Secretariat not previously authorized, $1,615,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Committee Finance Total Department Operation Expenditures not previously authorized, $7,655,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Committee, please turn to page 10 of the table document. Department of Health and Social Services, Health and Social Services, Administrative and Support Services, not previously authorized, $2,684,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Health and Social Services, COVID Secretariat, not previously authorized, $11,707,000. Does committee agree? Or sorry, negative $11,707,000. Does committee agree? <coughs> uh, health and social services, health and social programs, $15,504,000. Does committee agree? Or sorry, not previously authorized, $15,504,000. Oh, member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I just, I think we should maybe talk about this. It's 15 million new dollars to the health 
authority, uh, and you know, 10 million of that is is coming from what was previously budgeted for the COVID secretariat. So I think we are in the final days of winding down the, the COVID secretariat. Uh, I, I guess I was just hoping the minister could perhaps give us an update uh, a few months ago when we approved the total COVID secretariat budget. There was some talk of keeping some staff on going forward as we switched to endemic status. Uh, there was some talk about perhaps keeping 811, just a bit of an update about what is going on with the COVID secretariat. Thank you. Thank you, member. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, yeah, I, I, I wish there would have been uh, the ability to give a bit of an update back when we were doing the main estimates as well. I think we all did. Um, but it was really a time of significant transi transition and flux uh, with COVID-19 at that time. So it was difficult to, to pin down exactly the timing or the amounts. Um, so this is before us now. With respect to more generally what's happening, um, there are efforts here to reflect a transition that transitions not only out of COVID but into hopefully better system capacity uh, given the impacts of COVID over the last two years and given likely to be some ongoing impacts. Um, there are still uh, you know, indicators that there's consistently uh, higher demands on public services, on public care services, higher demands on beds day to day, and uh, that those that are there are, are, are there often for, for a particular periods of time. So they're, they're able to track those things. So some of this reflects that. Um, there are still my, uh, questions uh, being called in and asked and the need to deliver uh, ongoing vaccine services and anticipated as vaccines become available for youth that that will continue as boosters are required that that will continue and again that, that you know there's a view to what can be done to transition successfully um, into again better services longer longer term uh, you know utilizing the, the phone capacity utilizing um, uh, the the public health services that we have now for testing for vaccination. So, um, so again, it, it, it sort of reflects a tra truly a transition from just what was uh, focused uh, almost solely or exclusively on COVID-19 to being focused on uh, providing care in the context of long-term uh, realities of COVID-19. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And yeah, and, and I'll just point that you know there's 15 million dollars here going. 10 million of it was from COVID Secretariat. So clearly, the the department did a bit of assessment of what is needed to increase that capacity for the endemic going forward, and needed an extra five million. But we also know that the Department of Health and Social Services, even with its budget, runs a deficit consistently. I, I'm just trying to understand of, uh, if there is still a gap. We think of increased. COVID costs on the healthcare system going forward, or, or whether we think, you know, I know <laughs> we're not going to make up the deficit, but whether we think this $15 million is, is adequately responding to what we need to do to make sure our healthcare system is properly funded in the year to come. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, at this point, the, the certainly the, you know, um, expectation based on the what was being done and what was being tracked over the last few months uh, on the, the last few months of where COVID was at um, you know that this is expected to to get us through that transition I'm, I'm hesitating because of course no, I don't think anyone really knows what may or may not happen um, say this fall um, you know there's certainly a hope that with the vaccination rates that we have with the availability of vaccinations for for youth for boosters, et cetera, that we won't be back uh, in any kind of significant situation and that this transition will provide uh, a transition that carries us through into a longer term state. And the comments with respect to the challenges that are in health and social services more generally, um, you know, again, I, I would point to, to the fact that there is inclusion here uh, of, uh, you know, increased capacity in community health care, uh, community LPNs, primary care, public health. Um, you know, recognizing the impacts of COVID-19 and what that did and allows now for, while this is transition related, it actually may well have longer term benefits that has to go through the business planning cycle that is, um, but, it, you know, when you start to move forward, you can go into the business planning cycle, at least with a sense of what these impacts might be and what the hiring might be. And so, you know, it may well be that this is a transition that, that leads to longer term change, but that certainly remains to be seen. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Health and Social Services, Health and Social Programs, not previously authorized, $15,504,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Committee? 
Health and Social Services, Total Department, Operation Expenditures Not Previously Authorized, $6,481,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Committee, please turn to page 11 of the table document, Department of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Industry, Tourism and Investment, Corporate Management, Not Previously Authorized, negative $201,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Industry, Tourism, Investment, Economic Diversification and Business Support, not previously authorized, $609,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Industry, Tourism, and Investment, Tourism and in Parks, not previously authorized, $600,000. Does committee agree? Hmm? Oh. <laughs> Member for Great Slave. Sorry, uh, Madam Chair, you're just so efficient. I, I missed my spot to stick my hand up. Um, I'm just curious to know, under the Tourism Restart Program, um, maybe the Minister can just provide a little bit of detail on, is that money going to end up um, in the hands of, of tourist businesses, or will some of that be used for corporate or administrative costs? Thank you. Thank you, Member. Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, this is intended to go out to the operators. It's an extension of um, funding that has coming large, through the federal government in this case. Uh, areas that we're targeting here is marketing and promotions, uh, the operations again of tourism uh, operators themselves, their capacity development, so training. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Great Slate. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm really glad to hear that. I know the tourism operators probably are as well. Um, I'm curious to know that if we, and I would assume we'll reach the $600,000, is there an opportunity for us to have more money come here, uh, or will we see another supplement coming? Thank you. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is right now a, a one-time programming. It is um, was part of. Sorry, I missed the name earlier. The Tourism Relief Fund, um, which came out from the from federal government and uh, is extended through to the end of next year. I, I do hope that it's fully subscribed. That is certainly the point. Um, it is uh, whether we'll need anything further. You know, can't say. Again, hoping we don't continue to need any sorts of relief or recovery. Um, the next stage of tourism funding would probably be looking over to the Tourism 2025, which is part of ITI's main estimates. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Industry, Tourism and Investment, Tourism and Parks, $600,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Committee, Industry, Tourism and Investment, Total Department Operations Expenditures, not previously authorized, $1,800,000. Does committee agree? Committee, please turn to page 12 of the table document, Department of Infrastructure. Infrastructure programs and services not previously authorized, eight, sorry, $8,065,000. Does committee agree? Member for Frame Lake. Yeah, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I guess I've seen a lot of money kind of moved around, shuffled around within this low carbon economy leadership fund agreement and uh, it looks like we're not able quite frankly to get money out the door the, maybe the criteria for accessing this money uh, don't allow for folks to access it I, I just don't really understand what the the, the, the problems are can I get uh, an explanation here thanks madam chair thank you minister of finance uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, there were a number of reasons. Well, there's a number of different funds operated, as the members indicated, um, and the different funds, there were different reasons why they may not have gone all out uh, initially. Um, but it is my understanding now that uh, with uh, COVID-19 behind us and various challenges associated to that, um, that there should be some money going out. The There's initiatives including Arctic Energy Alliance programs, uh, GHG grant programs, 
Um, there was some low uptake uh, under the industry buildings GHG grant program, but again, I, I, my understanding is that some of that um, was capacity that has now been resolved, um, and as well, building retrofits and carbon sequestration, sequestration uh, which was led by ENR, um, are all now, is my understanding, anticipating that they will be able to, to utilize uh, these dollars in full. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, can someone tell me then this commercial and industrial greenhouse gas grant fund, what is it all about and who can actually access it? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, Madam Chair, I believe that Industry and Buildings GHD grant fund or grant program. Um, Madam Chair, that would be an application-based grant program to support energy efficiency, renewable energy, and fuel substitution in industry and commercial buildings. Um, so, uh, Madam Chair, that is and by application-based. Thanks, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. The uh, money for the Arctic Energy Alliance programs and services uh, um, it, it just kind of fluctuates up and down and uh, and I know I've raised the issue of at least one federal program that requires um, an energy audit by certified auditors and there's only one or two of them or something here in the Northwest Territories. Um, how do we uh, increase the access to uh, some of these programs that Arctic Energy Alliance is running and has there been any progress made on um, a requirement of an audit before you do something and then again afterwards? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I, I think that you know, with respect to the, the administration of the program, um, that is probably a question best left uh, to the department. I, I can certainly direct it to my colleague, or I can certainly undertake to ensure that uh, now that we are seeking to move this money forward, that uh, that, the, that the departments that are involved, both uh, infrastructure and ENR, are doing so mindful of the fact that we we want to get the money out the door. So. Um, taking the comments around the availability of assessors into account when we do that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, I would actually like to hear from the Minister of the Infrastructure about that, if it, that's at all possible. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Chair. My computer just locked up, so... <laughs> I'll try and give this a shot. It won't do anything for me. The um, the Arctic Energy Alliance, you know, we did have, um, we're in the process of training some of the staff. There is a federal requirement in terms of, you know, what sort of um, training is required, but we have two that are in the process of getting trained to be able to keep up to the amount of work requests that we're seeking. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, once the minister is able to get her computer uh, unlocked, I'd be happy to get more information uh, on that. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member. Did you have any further questions for the minister? And we will get that commitment from the Minister of Infrastructure to give back to us with that information. Thank you. Member for Frame Lake. Uh, Madam Chair, I think I saw the Minister shaking her head vigorously, yes. So happy to take that commitment, and uh, that's all I got on this item. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Chair, I'm going to have a rather specific question about the Active Carbon Sequestration and Forestry Fund. Uh, oh. yeah, my, my understanding is this, well, it was initially a 2019 election promise by the Prime Minister to plant 2 billion trees. Uh, that's where it started, I believe. And then we, for a number of years, couldn't spend it uh, because there's a long-standing kind of policy in ENR that we don't actually do tree planting and reforestation. It's, uh, we, we wait for the forest to naturally regrow itself. But now it appears we are spending that money and replanting some trees. So if someone could just tell me uh, the total amount we're spending on tree planting and, and, and what, how that kind of changed or where we're planting trees, anything about this, really. Thank you. 
Thank you, member. Minister of Finance, did you have a I just might, Madam Chair. Thank you. So, um, 21-22, I mean, I, I, nothing in front of me indicates a, a firm policy against planting of trees. Um, and 2021-22 ENR, uh, in fact, uh, exceeded their budget by 28,000 and change. Um, and uh, are planning to continue to, to do this, to, to plant trees and participate in this program. Um, this is mostly summer field work, which is why there were some delays uh, on, in terms of the timing of the funds flowing out. Um, but again, as I've indicated, it's certainly my understanding that uh, they will be able to make use of these of the dollars, um, but doing so in a way that uh, you know uh, accounts for the northern climate and for the, the kinds of environment that we have here. And so that may you know. Um, I hope that provides the member enough assurance that they'll be uh, will be participating in that fund. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to ask a couple more questions. I guess I, I'm wondering uh, the total amount on tree planting we're spending, and uh, if the minister has any idea or, or knows in front of her where where we're planting trees. Thank you. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. So for 22-23, anticipated total spend is $291,000. The, the total amount um, under the active forestry carbon sequestration, sequestration fund, um, ultimately, Madam Chair, is projected to be $1.333 million. As for where they will go, um, they will be planted in the Northwest Territories, Madam Chair. <laughs> I don't have that information, but I'll endeavor to get it for us. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Infrastructure programs and services not previously authorized, eight million sixty-five thousand dollars. Does committee agree? Infrastructure regional operations not previously authorized, negative one million ninety-seven thousand dollars. Does committee agree? Uh, infrastructure total department operation expenditures not previously authorized, six million. $968,000. Does committee agree? Committee, please turn to page 13 of the table document, Department of Justice. Justice, community justice and policing not previously authorized. $750,000. Does committee agree? Member for Frame Lake. Yep, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. As I understand, this is uh, federal money. And I know I've spoken to the issue of uh, victim services before, and I, um, the La Minister of Justice in the last government actually undertook a, a review of victim services at my request, but um, and it found that you know we don't we could be providing better support to the coordinators that and the NGOs that actually do much of this very important work. So this $750,000 kind of windfall from the federal government. Um, is there a breakdown of how that money is going to be spent? And I, I guess what I want to make sure is that some of that funding is going to go to support the, the important work of the coordinators. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, Madam Chair, for 22-23, um, it, it's not. It's not a windfall. It's um, it's funding that uh, does come in from the federal government's uh, under anticipated programming to a certain degree. So for 22-23, we have just shy of $200,000 in salary and benefits, but uh, $492,000 does go out for contributions and grants, um, and a small proportion for operations and maintenance. Now, as for you know the individual breakdown of how that happens, organization by organization. Um, Madam Chair, I, I, I am conscious that there's an additional outstanding obligation uh, that was agreed to to look at how we are doing those contribution agreements. So I don't have the update on that yet, but I am certainly alive to the fact that that, uh, that that commitment was previously made in our budget discussions and I'm still committed to it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. And, okay. Yeah, I understand we're going to get then some further information about that. Yeah, part of my reason for asking that too is that um, there isn't a, we don't have a complete network 
uh, of uh, victim services coordinators across all of the regions, let alone the communities themselves. So I think we, we do need to do some more work in, towards uh, um, better supporting victims of uh, violence and um, the coordinators that, that uh, try to connect them with uh, services and support as well. So um, I'll be curious to see whether any of that this funding is going to be used to uh, um, move towards a more complete network. But I look forward to getting that information. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member. Minister, did you have any to follow? Okay. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, only to note, um, there is some of this funding does specifically support a victim services coordinator position, uh, which can help hopefully answer some of that concern of ensuring that there are services being provided uh, to those communities uh, that don't necessarily have staffing. Um, I can note that there is an extension now of victim services programming uh, into Fort McPherson and Fort Providence that previously did not have staff. So um, incrementally, there is at least some increase in the availability of staff to, to communities outside of regional centres. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Tabacha. Madam Chair, um, the windfall of $750,000 should be going to the actual victims of uh, serious crimes. Um, you know, there's a, a very serious crime that happened in the community of Fort Smith and, uh, uh, you know, some of these funds should be uh, allocated to people that the whole community was affected by this crime and um, you know they, they on the website it has uh, clean up uh, uh, you know uh, securing uh, doors and some of these things and uh, but you know uh, we always make sure that uh, the the uh, per, uh, the person who committed the crime has legal services and um, uh, all the way through, but uh, the people uh, that uh, are victims of the crime, the complete family of uh, a violent crime, is not covered. And it's at the discretion of the uh, Justice Department. So I'm just wondering if you could just please, uh, Madam Chair, uh, if the Minister could explain uh, that part of it. Uh, you know, uh, it's all right to uh, ensure that we uh, uh, look after the administration parts, but uh, I'm more concerned about the people that are affected, especially the victims, whether it be, uh, it could be other crimes, but there's got to be a better way of actually looking after the victims uh, and not so much concentrated on because we all have those, we have all those other things in place already with uh, victim services. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, there, there is the Northwest Territories Victim of Crime Emergency Fund. Um, I would certainly, you know, acknowledge that, that there's, there's not really going to be any amount that remotely compensates someone who's been a victim of a serious crime. Um, that this is one of the ones though that does try to help out in terms of some emergency or immediate planning that might happen. I mean, and I think the member mentions, you know, the fixing of a door for instance, or replacing of a lock. Uh, so, you know, really uh, small things in the scale of what can occur to someone who's been impacted by a violent event. Um, so, and some of the funding within this does go into that fund to support those activities. It's a fund to which individuals can apply uh, I, I, I am grateful for this opportunity. I think some of people don't know that that funding is available uh, when they need it. So this is certainly an opportunity to, to highlight that. Um, I mean, more generally, Madam Chair, there's, there's you know, a host of things uh, that the Department of Justice um, no doubt provides in terms of the availability of legal counsel and legal aid. Um, and that the community organizations then turn around and provide as well in terms of legal services, advice, supports, um, you know, assistance in attending in court, for instance, uh, public prosecution service as well. Federal government has as well victims wit or witness coordinators who can also provide supports and assistance. So um, it's, it is a, a challenging area in terms of understanding and making available all the many and different supports that would be needed. 
Um, I don't have sort of dollar by dollar because again, some of that w won't be GNWT provided services. Um, I, I certainly could uh, undertake, and I don't know that Minister Simpson or I have the number here, but the total amount that's in the Victim of Emergency Fund, uh, if, that's, uh, if that's of interest to the member, I'll certainly commit to, to provide the exact dollar. It, I mean, it would have been in the main estimates, um, and we can now update as to the total amount that's available following the supplementary appropriation. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Tabatcha. Uh, during that during that time that this of the serious in, incident in March, the whole community was in lockdown. It was a very very serious situation, and um, you know, and uh, there's a lot of disappointment with some of the things that happened uh, with regards to uh, uh, seeing. We always seem to protect the uh, the uh, person who. Uh, who potentially committed the crime, but uh, we always, uh, and we kind of make sure that everything is right for that person, but we always forget about uh, what's right for the victims. And uh, I think that that family was victimized and will, they would never ever get over it. It's a life-changing uh, situation for them it's a life-changing situation for the community. Uh, people are uh, very, um, very sad about what happened there. And uh, when you have funds available like this, we should be making sure that the victims of crime are looked after first and not administration. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member for Tabacha. Did you have any further questions for the Minister? I don't have any question. Just justice, community justice and policing, not previously authorized. Seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Does committee agree? Thank you, committee. Justice, total department <coughs> operations expenditures, not previously authorized. Seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Does committee agree? Thank you, committee. Please turn to page fourteen of the table document, Department of Lands. Lands corporate management not previously authorized, negative $48,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Lands planning and coordination not previously authorized, negative $70,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Lands sorry, total department operations expenditures not previously authorized, negative $118,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Committee, please turn to page 15, or sorry, 15 of the table document, Department of Municipal and Community Affairs. Municipal and Community Affairs, Community Governance, not previously authorized, negative $10,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Municipal and Community Affairs, Directorate, not previously authorized, negative $2,000. Does committee agree? Thank you. Municipal and Community Affairs, Public Safety, $14,762,000. Does committee agree? Member for Hay River South. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, I just want to talk about the, uh, the $10, $10 million that has been set aside for uh, emergency response activities uh, related to the 2022 flooding. <laughs> so is that... I guess trying to get a sense of if that amount was used uh, during the, uh, I guess, the initial stages uh, dealing with the flood, or is that amount to be used for, uh, I guess, uh, covering damages uh, for uh, people who have, uh, I guess, who were victims of the flood? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, it's Madam Chair. <laughs> Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, at this point, uh, the, the, having made it into the supplementary appropriation, uh, this is really just a very initial amount. Uh, and at this point, my understanding is that the assessors, of course, still have to do their work. 
um, in order to ascertain exactly what the, the damages will be and then the, the full damage compensation process can begin under the disaster assistance policy you know and again for for whatever it's worth in this place madam chair i know the minister has asked all of us to emphasize the importance of folks registering um, both businesses and residential uh, individuals or people who have residential impacts but this 10 million dollars really was an initial amount to 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 help support the department of maca to get out um, as the emergency was unfolding provide emergency services uh, such as sheltering um, and I, I anticipate that there will be more to come as the the full extent of the damage is better known thank you thank you minister member for hay river south thank you madam thank you madam chair has any of uh, this money i guess made its way to uh, to victims uh, especially ones that don't have the final financial resources to i guess sustain sustain themselves like we have we have people out there that uh, you know that have uh, are financially stable they you know they may have a mortgage but they're able to uh, you know they have to move out of their house they can uh, rent a hotel or whatever but we have those people who are who are you know living uh, paycheck to paycheck that just don't have those resources they're paying a mortgage they're paying rent so I guess I'm asking is has any of this uh, <coughs> of these funds been uh, made their way to any of them thank you thank you Minister of Finance Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, at this point, uh, th that I think that's unlikely. Um, and uh, you know, I will say I, that I know when I had attended in Hay River, and I know Minister Thompson has been there, and Premier. Um, I think more than several ministers now have actually attended um, to Hay River. We were all quite keenly aware of the impacts. The, there has been an RFP out now to help support and provide short-term accommodations. Um, within the community for individuals who can't return to their homes and who will require those supports. As far as uh, you know, providing money into the hands of individuals, you know, again, this, this 10 million is, is not that amount. Um, there's, there's no doubt going to be, uh, we will see in a, in a future session, which will be the fall session, uh, a much more detailed update of amounts that are being provided for those who are needing disaster and assistance uh, funds into their hands. Um, but uh, you know, this this is not that uh, that piece. This 10 million here was just the emergency part. Um, but uh, you know, again, the department will have and already is in there in the community, providing pathfinding services and providing the emergency services, including accommodations. Um, so, if there are still individuals who are struggling, I can only encourage them to contact the the, the pathfinding services, which are. Um, you know, many lessons learned from last, last year about the importance of having those four individuals who will be in a state of, uh, of emergency need for some time. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I guess my concern, I guess, uh, with this amount, it, it is a start, and I understand that, you know, the amount that we're going to be looking at is going to be substantially higher than this. However, uh, you know, we, we have assessments that have been completed, uh, I'm not sure if numbers have been put to them, but I'm hoping that's going to happen soon. And if that does, uh, you know, it goes back to Pathfinder is my understanding, and they sit down with the uh, uh, with the resident and uh, and uh, I guess come to uh, some agreement that the number is good and uh, maybe a an advance. So if all of a sudden we get a uh, you know an influx of those uh, of people in there. Uh, the ten million dollars isn't going to cover it, so I guess the question is: is you know how soon will we be seeing uh, an additional amount? Thank you. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, we don't have uh, substantiation of amounts in time for the spring session. Uh, it was I don't know that it was ever anticipated that we would have had the kind of substantiation necessary to make it into the spring session. Um, you might recall that last year with the floods, a special warrant was done and it had it brought uh, in for fall. Um, so, you know, I, I certainly don't want residents to think that simply because of the timing of session that funding won't be available. Um, the disaster assistance policy was updated uh, such that the cap is now at $240,000 and that doesn't change based on the timing of session. Um, you, you know, there are, there are ways in which the government can manage uh, funds to ensure that when people are getting 
uh, there have their assessments done and that the, the monies are ready to go out that, that we can ensure that that money will be available to them. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member? Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I thank the uh, Minister for the answer because, uh, you know, that's what I was looking for is that when those assessments uh, start to, you know, uh, start to hit the desk of the Pathfinder and agreements are made, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, the advances can go out and people can start working on their, uh, repairing their homes or replacing them uh, right away. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, and I, I appreciate the question as well. I, yet again, I don't, you know, I don't have the answer. I'm not going to necessarily support or, or say exactly um, for sure this will be a special warrant situation or if there will be other um, <coughs> tools used in, the, in this instance. What I can say again is that, uh, um, you know, that people should be using their insurance if they have it, going to the disaster assistance relief policy via MACA for, by registering, uh, and uh, the policy is there and we're going to adhere to it and the money will be there for people who, who qualify. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Hay River South. Questions, thank you. Thank you. Um, members, noting the clock. I will now rise and report progress. Thank you to the ministers, uh, minister, and thank you to the witnesses. Sergeant at Arm, please escort the witnesses from the chamber. Order! <laughs> May I please have the report of Committee of the Whole, Member for Nevicton Lakes. Mr. Speaker, your committee has been considering table document 658-192, and I would like to report progress. And Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the Committee of the Whole be concurred with. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nevicton Lakes. Do we have a seconder? Member for Yellowknife North, all those in favour? All those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is carried. Mr. Clerk, orders of the day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Orders of the day for Thursday, June 2nd, 2022 at 1.30 p.m. Prayer, minister statements, member statements, returns to oral questions, recognition of visitors in the gallery, acknowledgments, oral questions, written questions, returns to written questions, replies to the commissioner's address, Petitions, reports of committees on the review of bills, reports of standing and special committees, tabling of documents, notice of motions, motions, motions 56-192, motion 57-192, notice of motions for first reading of bills, first reading of bills, second reading of bills, consideration in committee of the whole of bills and other matters, 
Bill 23, Bill 29, Bill 40, Committee Report 30-192, Committee Report 31-192, Table Document 657 and Table Document 658, Report of Committee of the Whole, Third Reading of Bills, Orders of the Day. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. This House stands adjourned until June 2nd, 2022 at 1.30 p.m. Order.